Yeah. I got an eye on Madam Clerk, are we live? I heard that. Yeah. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Lakewood City Council agenda for this Monday, March 20, 2023. And Madam Clerk, if you'd please call the roll. Council Member Anderson. Here. Council Member Bell. Here. Member Bokey. Here. Council Member Brandstutter. Here. Council Member Loricella. Here. Deputy Mayor Moss. Here. And Mayor Whalen. Present. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Now, if you'd please stand and join me in a brief moment of silence for our men and women serving this great country, both here and abroad, as well as our first responders, one of whom was impacted by a shooting in Seattle today, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance to our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you all for being here. It's great to see you all tonight on this uh, somewhat sunny Monday evening here. It's almost the first day of spring tomorrow, so we're all celebrating. We have some special things to celebrate tonight in addition to the coming of spring, and the first is a swearing in of our newest council member, Treston Loricella. So, Treston, if you would please join our municipal court judge, Lisa Mansfield, up at the podium, and she will administer the oath of office as council member here in the city of Lakewood. Shall I use this mic or this mic? This one. Okay. If you'll repeat after me, I state your name. I, Preston, do solemnly swear that I am a citizen of the United States. Solemnly swear that I am a citizen of the United States. And of the state of Washington. And the state of Washington that I will support the Constitution and laws of the United States, Constitution and laws of the United States, the Constitution and laws of the state of Washington, Constitution and laws of the state of Washington, and the laws of the city of Lakewood, and the laws of the city of Lakewood, and will to the best of my judgment, skill, and ability, and will to the best of my judgment, skill, and ability, Truly, faithfully, diligently, truly, faithfully, diligently, and impartially perform the duties of the office of council member, and impartially perform the duties, and impartially perform the duties of the office of council member, of the office of council member, in and for the city of Lakewood, in and for and Pierce County, Washington, and Pierce County, Washington, as such duties are prescribed by law. Congratulations. Okay. And Tristan, we certainly uh, give your family members a chance to come down and get a photograph with you and we'll clear the deck here so we don't have you know bad background for your shots so if your family members want to come up to the front we'll we'll move for a minute
Well, great. Well, welcome, Council Member Laura Sella. It's great to have you on the dais here, and I'm sure you will serve with a plum as we move forward on many of the uh, significant issues here of the day and certainly of the next term. Next is our proclamation and presentation section of tonight's agenda. The first item is a proclamation recognizing March 29, 2023 as National Vietnam War Veterans Day. And for this, I am pleased and proud to have Mr. Bob Warfield join me at the podium. Mr. Warfield is here as one of our esteemed members of the Lakewood community to receive the proclamation on behalf of many Vietnam veterans uh, who are both still with us and those who are not due to their service. Mr. Warfield was enlisted in the United States Coast Guard from 1954 to 1959. He served aboard five ships from Staten Island to Hawaii, the Arctic, the Philippines, and the Caribbean Islands. Disciplined for swimming across Honolulu Harbor. As a certified able seaman in 1959, Bob sailed aboard an MSTS Liberty ship from Brooklyn to resupply Tool Air Force Base in Greenland. He then served in the United States Army from 1960 to 1976 as an E3 to O4, Officer 4, as in Captain, right, sir? Something like that. <laughs> Attended basic OCS infantry and general staff assignments in the United States, Germany, Okinawa, Vietnam, South Korea. He joined the headquarters of the 4th ROTC region at Fort Lewis in 1973. Various achievements include his high school GED, USCG college degree in the Army, and he led 12 ROTC summer campers to the summit in Mount Rainier July 4th, a year prior to retirement in 1976. The photo that's on screen was taken by a Navy photographer attached to the 2nd Battalion, 503rd Infantry and Airborne Unit, 173rd Brigade, on July 7, 1965, following an action in the war zone about 40 miles north of Saigon. The 173rd Airborne Brigade, first among major army units, was sent to Vietnam and became the, the, the longest serving United States combat unit. For Mr. Warfield, mountaineering, travel, and civic interests have followed. He was involved in the Lakewood Incorporation for eight years. That whole process took that long, but they were successful in 1996. He's also been involved with the Boys and Girls Clubs from Tacoma from 1988 to 1996 and helped provide organized activity for youth in the Lakeview community. Bob remains active with the Lakewood Community Foundation Fund, extending his service to this community since 1975. Colonel Bernard West from the 2-2 Striker Brigade sends his Congratulations and thanksgiving to you for your long-standing service. And we will join with the photograph after I present this proclamation on behalf of the city of Lakewood. And then I believe you have a few comments and a video. Is that right, uh, sir? A few photos. A few photos. Very good. On behalf of the council members here in the city of Lakewood and all of us, we are pleased to present this proclamation Whereas the Vietnam War was a long, costly, and divisive conflict that pitted the communist government of North Vietnam against South Vietnam and its principal ally, the United States. And whereas for almost two decades during this conflict, Americans raised their right hands and committed to serve and defend our Constitution as uniform members of the United States Armed Forces during a time when opposition to the Vietnam War created a bitter division among many Americans. And whereas throughout the years of the Vietnam War, more than 3 million people were killed, including over 58,000 Americans, while 9 million Americans returned home with the title of United States veteran. At the time of their return, many of these veterans were not welcomed home or thanked for their service due to opposition to the war. That's why today and every day, we honor their bravery and commitment and give thanks to a generation of Americans who valiantly fought in service of their country. And whereas the city of Lakewood honors all those who served in the Vietnam War 
and recognizes the continued impact the conflict has had on so many veterans and their families, their caregivers and survivors. And whereas in 2012, our nation launched a 13 year commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War to ensure that every veteran, family, caregiver and survivor impacted by this war knows and experiences our gratitude for their sacrifice. And now therefore the Lakewood City Council hereby observes March 29, 2023 as National Vietnam War Veterans Day. And we commemorate the hardships and sacrifices of those who served and their families who supported them before, during and after the war. Proclaim this 20th day of March, 2023, Jason Whalen, Mayor. Bob, it's an honor and a pleasure, sir. Thank you. And we do have the Lakewood Challenge coin that you're used to receiving as a military person. Uh, these were developed a few years back by a few of us military folks. And it says, cooperating for the greater prosperity of Lakewood. So it's in Latin, but I gave you the, the better version <laughs> that I could understand. So there you are, sir. Being an attorney. Yeah, there you are. Thank you. Floor is yours, Bob. Oh, thank you. Well, I must apologize to all of you uh, that my jacket doesn't fit quite so well, but it's infantry blue. <laughs> Lest we forget some personal insights about Vietnam, the Indochina Wars rooted in Japanese occupation spanned 1946 to 1940, uh, 1991. Our war, as seen from afar, was the American War. It got serious in 1965 with Third Marines waiting ashore in Da Nang on 8 March, one day after Bloody Sunday in Selma. On 5 May, the day we arrived also from Okinawa, 40 male students from UC Berkeley stood in front of the city's draft board and burned their draft cards. Vietnam was partitioned at the 17th parallel north in 1954, 280, uh, excuse me, 2,082 miles south and a good deal west of Lakewood, following French failure to reestablish colonial presence after losing 175,000 dead, missing, and captured including 20,000 French soldiers. Think of that next time Costco rotates your Michelins. Today, we don't think twice about the price of latex, but rubber was gold in 1940. When we arrived, Bao Dai was history, Jim was gone, Quat was prime minister, Taylor was ambassador and Kennedy was dead. As with Mao in China, so with Ho in Vietnam, a chasm of political hubris shadowed events that could have moderated nationalist alienation from Western tradition driven by poverty, pride, and colonial experience. I believe Kennedy would have ended the war. True, he approved expansive attention following the drift of American support begun secretly under Truman but he was stung by Bay of Pigs facing re-election and a deft politician. Johnson had McNamara and both had Maxwell Taylor who counseled war. Overt American involvement became a decade, uh, began a decade earlier, officially in November, 1955, fearful of dominoes, involvement became intrusion and a political morass we never fully grasped before Tet 1968. Between January 1968 and January 1971, two things changed. Walter Cronkite opined defeat and Creighton Abrams figured out how to win. He set about doing so for that was the mission. But as Congress wilted strategic interdiction was restricted and on July 1, 1973, all American funding to fight was stopped. 
Events in Battle of 1974 and early 75 showed the South could fight and did, but we were coming home. And the final curtain, a crescendo of dramatic calamity in the final weeks of April 1975 became inevitable. We live in a nation of 16 and a half million veterans, roughly four and a half percent of our population. Around 610,000 Vietnam vets are alive today who were among 2.7 million Americans who served in country. Two thirds volunteered for the service they performed. There are 58,281 names on the Vietnam Memorial Wall. Here are four. PFC Thomas C. Van Campen. Thomas Van Campen was killed in a firefight one month after arriving from Fort Bragg in June 1965. His company returned to the scene of fighting the following day, but was unable to recover his body. To this day, Tom Van Campen remains among 1,241 missing in action. American vets. Tom came from Oroville, California. He was 19. Okay. PFC Milton L. Olive III. Skipper Olive was a bright light among friends in the 3rd Platoon Bravo Company, 2nd Battalion, 503rd Airborne. He defied the odds of a black kid in rural Mississippi to achieve scholarship laurels before joining the Army. For his swift action and sacrifice on 22 October 1965, President Johnson flew to Chicago five months later to present the Medal of Honor to his father. Skipper Olive was 18. Second Lieutenant Carol Ann Drasba barely had time to graduate from State Hospital School of Nursing Scranton in Pennsylvania, clear army orientation and arrive at Third Field Hospital in Saigon before climbing into a helicopter bound for 9030 back hospital. From Camp Sin in Benoit, we could see distant smoke. There were seven aboard. Carol Ann was 22. Major Michael O'Donnell. David Weiss wrote a book about Michael in our time to laud the talent, tragic end, and astonishingly heroic effort above and beyond to save a special operations group long range patrol team in desperate straits from death more certain than the one that came. Michael looked to a promising life, music, poetry, love left behind, compelled to serve when his country called. Like Tom, Skipper, and Carol Ann, over two thirds, as mentioned, two thirds of the 2.7 million Americans who served were volunteers. Michael, his crew, and those he tried to save went missing in action for nearly 30 years before being returned to America and interred at Arlington. I visit his grave with others in section 60 on Vets Day each November. Michael left a poem for us uh, written on New Year's Day in 1970, weeks before he died. If you are able, save a place for them inside of you and save one backward glance when you are leaving for the places they can no longer go. Be not ashamed to say you love them, though you may or may not have always. Take what they left and what they have taught you with their dying and keep it with your own. And in that time, when men decide and feel safe to call this war insane, take one moment to embrace those gentle heroes you left behind. On behalf of these four, their families, and 610,000, and all those who are now deceased, I accept this proclamation with gratitude. And I thank you all for your attention. And I hope that we will learn to avoid insane wars in the future. Thank you all for your service. Good night.
Mr. Warp, Mr. Warfield, why don't you join us up front? We'll take a photograph and thank you for your incredible poignant words tonight. Well said. <laughs> well, thanks again, Mr. Warfield. Very much appreciated. And in the spirit of recognition of service, both abroad and here at home, we have a proclamation recognizing Scott McKay for his service and commitment here to the city of Lakewood. And I would like to call on our Assistant Chief John Unford to join Mr. McKay if he's here. I think he's here up at the podium. Come on up, Scott. And Mary, if you'd come on up too, Mary Dodsworth. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm good to see you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Well, there are many things that go, uh, unfortunately, unsaid sometimes in the city of Lakewood. And, and often that is a thank you for a deed well done and done without provocation or prompting. And that is what we're here to celebrate tonight. City of Lakewood issues this proclamation to Scott McKay. Whereas Scott McKay is a longtime resident of the city of Lakewood, and whereas in 2006, Scott began volunteering with the Lakewood Adopt a Street program to help clean up litter and to beautify the city by adopting three city streets. And whereas Scott has donated hundreds of hours since then cleaning the city of trash, junk, and debris, often separating and recycling the materials he finds. And whereas Scott goes the extra mile, went out in our community, returning abandoned shopping carts and even cleaning up areas along state-owned freeway entrances so that visitors to Lakewood have a great first impression of our community. And whereas Scott volunteers his time in city parks by watering trees and plants and doing other jobs throughout the city year round and in all kinds of weather. And whereas in 2021, the city planted 32 oak trees in the community which were propagated from memorial trees that line the Boulevard of Remembrance to honor World War I veterans. Scott spent the next two years watering and tending to those trees to ensure their survival. And whereas Scott has demonstrated the civic values of service and commitment that make Lakewood the strong community that it is today. Now, therefore, the City of Lakewood City Council hereby recognizes Scott McKay for his continued service and commitment to our community and for making a difference in the city of Lakewood. And we encourage all residents to consider ways that they too can help make Lakewood a fabulous place to live. Proclaim this 20th day of March, 2023, Jason Whalen, Mayor. Scott, thank you very much for your service. And we're gonna present you also with a challenge coin, sir. Thank you. 
with congratulations for work well done. And we will take a picture after the fact, but Mary Donsworth is here as well as the Assistant Chief Unfred to thank you for your incredible contributions. Mary and Chief, would you like to say a few words? Well, I just wanna say that if we had every citizen in Lakewood that took such personal responsibility for their community, um, we would be even e an even better place to play and to live and to work. And I just can't say enough about this man. He's humble. He does this giving without any expectation of, of reward or recognition. And we just love having him in our community. And we're so grateful. So thank you so much for your service. And I just want to add to that, the uh, motto of the Lakewood Police Department is making a difference. And this is an excellent example of that. And so we actually ran across him and how this all started was that he was helping clean up an encampment along I-5 that had sort of been uh, festering for a while. And so, and then we discovered how long he had been doing this. So uh, we thank you again for making a difference in our community. Yeah. Scott, you're welcome to say a few words of encouragement so others can follow your lead if you'd like. We'll take a picture. Sure. I, I'm really honored to be here. It's really impressive. I only live a couple miles from here, and I thought, well, maybe I could come over and see how the city council operates. But uh, it's my honor to help out in the city. I, I, I take pride in that. I was out on Bridgeport this afternoon cleaning up newspapers. And so, but uh, it gives me satisfaction, and I know that it helps people driving up and down a busy thoroughfare uh, make, you know, take pride in their community. And I, I try to do that much as I can. Um, just one question. If I could have somebody on the city council who has more clout than I have to help to convince the Department of Transportation that I can pick up things alongside the on-ramps, which apparently aren't, it's not possible, but I've been doing it since 2018, but I was asked not to do it by the Department of Transportation. And I thought, I, I'm just, you know, just a regular guy, but if someone here can help me migrate or however you get through the hierarchy at the Department of Transportation to actually clean up all the debris and the car parts and you name it. You've seen them on those four. I specialize in the Bridgeport on ramps, but uh, I just, I'm hit a dead end and I've talked to Bryn before and I've talked to others and uh, basically I don't get any place. So I just would like to know if someone here could help me navigate. We'll do what we can. I appreciate that. No promises, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and we'll take a quick photograph up here with council. Mr. McKay, if you come on up. And, and next time a WashDOT person tells you uh, to, to not do what you're doing, your first question back should be, if you would do it, I wouldn't have to, right? <laughs> yes, you may. Come on up. Okay, well that concludes the presentation and proclamation section of tonight's agenda. We now turn to public comments. Public comments are accepted by mail, email, or by live virtual or in-person comment. Comments may be submitted in advance by mail to our city clerk, Brianna Schumacher at 6000 Main Street Southwest here in Lakewood, or via email at her email address, bschumacher at cityoflakewood.us. Comments received up to an hour before the meeting have been provided to the city council electronically, but for the record, our clerk will read the names of those who have submitted comments in advance. Ms. Schumacher. Mayor, we received comments in advance from Casey Crook, Keith Schuster, Kim Underwood, and from an email address, momshouse1 at yahoo.com. They did not indicate their name or city of residence. Very good. 
And the reason we do that is if you are here tonight and you've submitted written comments, you need not repeat them uh, orally, but you're certainly welcome to do so. We just wanna make sure that you know that you've been heard and the comments have been submitted. Members of the audience may comment on items related to any matter pertaining to city business during the public comment period. Comments are limited to three minutes per person. We simply ask that when you approach the podium, when called upon, that you just announce your residence of uh, record, Paul Bokey, Lakewood, Washington, and then you'll have your three minutes. Virtual comments are also authorized. If you'd like to provide live virtual public comments, please join the Zoom meeting as an attendee by dialing the telephone number listed on the screen, entering the meeting ID number as indicated, and use the star nine feature to raise your hand to be called upon. What I try to do is rotate back and forth, whether I call on folks in person here first or the Zoom folks first. And so tonight is the Zoom folks turn to be first. And so the clerk will reflect who has their virtual hand raised to be called upon during the public comment period. And at this time, I see Mr. Dennis Haugen's hand raised. Mr. Haugen. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Dennis Haugen here, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, former <clears throat> resident of Lakewood. A couple of interesting things from the last meeting. You were starting to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusiveness, <clears throat> which of course is a, is a motto that gets thrown around for uh, a lot of very bad things. And it's also interesting to me to think back in 2018 and 2020, your voters in your area effectively married yourself to the Mexican drug cartel, which we have over more people killed from fentanyl and the heavy traffic there than even the Vietnam War. But that's all kind of, kind of a crazy thing. A lot of themes in there, a lot of bad things being done, uh, kind of by a loose group. A lot of it seems to come out of the education. That's my opinion. And, uh, you know, teaching that, uh, you know, victimology, you know, tell kids you got to tell kids you treat it so badly, you never got a chance. So therefore, they don't uh, study in school because they're getting essentially indoctrinated. And that's a big factor there, in my opinion. And uh, then one more point. Um, you know, Caulfield is going to be, he's worth paying way more than you're paying him, way, way more. And um, primarily uh, the way he analyzed the traffic situation and projected out is to doing something that can save money for the city and save money for, this, for the uh, citizens. You know, it's interesting, my uh, insurance in Sioux Falls here is about $80 less than it was in Lakeland. And we have 80 mile an hour speed limits here and ice and snow and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we're gonna have to dig ourselves out of a lot of a mess that's been made in the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, people that think, normal people that think, in terms of money, are, be go are going to be out looking for managers like Caulfield, you know, that can project into a problem and then look at the solution and have it mean something financial, because that's what manage managers do. They try to keep the finances of an operation on track. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Schumacher, that is the last hand I see raised for virtual public commenters, unless you see something otherwise. There are no other virtual hands raised at this time. Very good. Then I will turn to those who have signed in on the sign-in sheet. The first is Mr. Don Russell.
followed by Dander and then Kim Underwood, just so you know where you are in the queue. My name is Don Russell. I'm a 93-year-old American Lake Shoreline property owner, a longtime resident of Lakewood. The apparent uh, impetus for this uh, two, uh, $272,000 Brown and Caldwell Clover Creek uh, floodplain study was the existence of an available governmental grant and a desire on the part of Lakewood's public works director to avail for the city a portion of that funding to conduct a Clover uh, Creek floodplain study. <clears throat> the study was not in response to the expressed concerns of the Clover Creek Streamside landowners. Their concerns are the annual drying of the creek and not flooding. The quantity and quality of water in the chamber in the clay in the city city's uh, reach of Clover Creek is determined by two phenomena. <clears throat> One is the <clears throat> amount of wet season precipitation that falls up gradient and managed by McCord Air Force Base and Pierce County Surface Water Management people. It is that water that flows through the lower reach of Clover Creek. The second phenomenon uh, is the level of underlying shallow aquifer groundwater and whether it is above or below the, uh, the creek's bed. If it's above the creek's bed, water flows in the creek. If it's below the creek bed, it causes the water in the creek to infiltrate into dry soil. It is McCord and Pierce County surface water management practices that determine whether Clover Creek floods in the winter or goes dry in the summer. Both these agencies have failed to capture, store, and cleanse and slowly infiltrate wet season precipitation in the manner that prevents wet season flooding and dry season uh, drying of the lake, of, of, of the creek. This is the problem that needs to be addressed, not the flooding problem. What needs is a comprehensive uh, plan for the uh, basin. Uh, to do this should involve affected homeowners and uh, not be relied upon uh, by consultants. Under the circumstances, option one, which is do nothing, is the appropriate option. Thank you. Thank you. And Earth, next. Good evening. I have two simple objectives in attending this evening. One, to make it perfectly clear how grateful we are for the city council's leadership and the uh, city of Lakewood's leadership and the administration side of things. Thank you for what you do. And it's an everyday, what's that? Okay. Okay. You might move it up. Is that on. better? Okay. And secondly, to share with you some um, personal experiences with commercial property and how your ordinance 782 and 73 relate to how we think that might be helpful in, in the world that we live in. Uh, we're investors, developers, and property owners in Thurston, Pierce, King, and Snohomish counties. So we experience uh, leadership in each one of those municipalities, those counties, and how this issue of drugs, homelessness, et cetera, is being dealt with. I'll speak tonight about Lakewood and the city of Tacoma, where we have properties in each one of those jurisdictions. In Tacoma, we own a $5 million office building on 5th Street, which is next door to the post office, if you're familiar with that corridor. Very mismanaged, tents, drugs, broken cars, etc. We were notified by MultiCare, who occupied until three months ago, two floors of that building, a three-floor building. They said, we can't be here anymore. We have to leave. That loss of that tenant takes a $5 million office building and makes it nearly worthless. That's our problem now as a property owner because the city of Lakewood, or excuse me, the city of Tacoma didn't take steps to manage that situation. I'll give you another story in Lakewood since I'm limited on time. And we own a shopping center at 512 South Tacoma Way and I-5, that intersection right next to Starbucks. 
four months ago, five months ago, I received a notice from a tenant in that shopping center saying, we're going to have to break our, break our lease, leave early. We cannot deal with what we're dealing with in the parking lot. We knew we couldn't leave, leave, lose, pardon me, that tenant. So we hired our own personal security. We hired a fencing company to put up steel fencing. We hired maintenance people to clean the parking lot every single day and created irregular schedules of security. Three weeks ago, I got a notification from that tenant that they appreciated what we had done and they planned on renewing their lease. I sent documents to that tenant to renew their lease today. That is not a responsibility that I have as a property owner to deal with drugs, homelessness, crime, cars being, being broken into, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, I've run out of time, but I want to encourage you in those ordinances, please. Thank you very Thank much. You. Next, Kim Underwood. Hi, uh, my name is Kim Underwood. I live here in Lakewood. Uh, Mayor Whalen, council members, thank you for the time. It's my understanding that the Public Works uh, Department will be updating you on the Clover Creek uh, flood management uh, study this evening. We feel a setback levy in the Springbrook area is not an appropriate option. Uh, enclosed in tonight's packet uh, are maps of the proposed project. Uh, federally designated surface water recharge areas, parcel maps, as well as photos. Setback levees do not effectively control groundwater, therefore will not restrict water to the creek channel. Springbrook lies within the FEMA recharge zone. Recent uh, coring within this area discovered water at six feet in the dry season. You restrict the flow, increase the speed, and you increase the liability. This will not only increase the chance of flooding for residents downstream on Clover Creek, but also increase erosion, destroy riparian areas, take out bridges, the increased risk of flooding the, over, the I-5 overpass at Clover Creek, where during last year's high water, uh, we took a measurement of 23 inches from the bottom of the bridge. Soil within the lower reaches of the basin as far west as Oak Brook are contaminated with PFAS. This is of concern to the established link between Clover, Clover Creek and tidal waters. Clover Creek's problem is not breaching its banks. It's its inability to, to sustain uh, flow, the lack of surface water recharge to be exact. Note attached photo across, uh, taken across stream from my place of a hundred year flood in 95. Clover Creek did not breach its banks. Rather, the groundwater came up, took the original path of the creek prior to it being moved. We recommend that the Public Works Department shift their focus to water cleansing and detention for alternative flood control management. Lakewood can't solve this problem alone. We need adults in the room here. We recommend the Lakewood Pierce County utilize, publish the US, current USGS model to formulate a, an effective basin, uh, basin management plan. I wanna leave you with one thing. Mark Twain said, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. And that's what it's come down to. So I recommend that everybody fill their liquor cabinets. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Mr. Ed Jacobs. Well, you're probably not going to like what I have to say. And I'm sorry that you're in the situation that you're in because- um, Can you give us your are, name real quick? Your name- I'm and, sorry, Ed Jacobs, Tacoma. Uh, okay. uh, there are no answers and uh, there are no easy answers for the homeless uh, situation. However, um, we're working on it and I've been working on it for 10 years. Um, and I work with the Homeless Coalition. One of the things that I'd like to do tonight is to invite you all to a homeless memorial service 
that'll be held on the 26th of March at Shiloh Baptist Church. There are 58 people that died in the last three months that were homeless. <clears throat> so we'll be remembering uh, those folks. And um, when I heard uh, the meeting last week, um, I heard Councilman uh, <clears throat> Anderson uh, with a quote, living under a blue tarp, we allow them to die with their rights on. Since Tacoma has implemented their sweeps and um, <clears throat> their, um, their new camping ban, 74 people have died. Somehow that didn't get into the report for the city of Tacoma, but if you're following their lead, please address that as well. People may not be arrested, but they do die. So thank you. Thank you. Next is Nikki Takamoto. Hi, my name is Nikki Takamoto, and I'm here representing the estate of Edith Takamoto, specifically the address of 9222 Hipkins Road. And I'm here in response to a proposed ordinance tonight. I'm requesting a postponement of the consider for you to consideration of the ordinance, specifically because we have received insufficient notice. Um, there was no proper protocol, and we have no time for any due follow-up. On February 21st, I received this package from the city of Lakewood. It was a proposal to pay us for the property that um, the city needs to acquire. This was mailed on February 21st. I received several days later. On February 28th, I received notification of this um, opportunity to, to eminent domain our land. We, up to that point, had no communication with anybody from the city. Hmm. My first um, awareness of this was being contacted. I'm not on social media. I'm not on Facebook. Um, I received someone just saying, hey, what is happening on Hipkins Road in Northway? I'm like, I don't know. Um, then, due to the alert of our neighborhood, uh, they let me know that there's people on property uh, doing something in on the land. Apparently, that's when they were placing the stakes to claim the land. I still had no idea that anyone was even going to be there. Next, <laughs> A couple of days after that, someone happened to be on property when they found other people there um, taking measurements. Um, and that's the first time I had contact with any, they left a business card. My time's running short here, so I'm just going to um, request what I'm asking for. We've had one week to decide basically whether to accept this settlement. Um, I'm asking the council, things look good on paper. I would like to uh, have someone be on site, look at the property and address our concerns and give us proper time to follow through with um, our concerns and questions. We um, also have pro concerns about exiting and entering our property. And there's been nothing to address, you know, how we're gonna fix that mostly the harm's way of being in the land itself. It's, it's visually right next to our main picture window, feet away from where this sidewalk and road are to come. Any other questions I'd like to address the concerns that we have as a family that doesn't allow me a time to defend anything here. Thank you, I appreciate Thank that. You.
Next name is difficult for me to read, so forgive me, but it's, is it Tamara J. Look? Hi, my name is Tambra Cook and I'm, in the, I'm a citizen of Lakewood. I live here and um, I'd like to talk about um, landlines. We need a landline. Nobody should have to sign a contract to a phone that uh, people can't read. They're not legible. They're not for the layman. These contracts on these cell phones were being taken advantage of basically because we're ignorant about electronics. Right now, I'm a metadata asset for somebody that can take my information and say, oh my goodness, this woman's intelligent. Google wants to do a, a study on these kind of people. I'm going to drop them into their study. Suddenly, your telephone's, saying, your telephone's doing weird things. What that is is a bot network table takeover. <laughs> You call your company. You don't know what's happening, but in the con in on the phone when you first read the phone, it says, "If at any time we can we can get rid of you, we don't have to keep you." This is on your device on your telephone. After that, it says, um, uh, "We can change your your contract without you knowing it. You have to always go to www and periodically check it." What they're doing is they're saying, okay, they're dropping you into different categories. They're meta bankers. They're saying we can make money off of you. We're going to drop you into a category that's going to make us money. So we're selling you as an asset. I'm mad. I'm tired of this crap. So um, it's affecting all of our lives. It's affecting the homeless people. It's affecting the lady that's losing her house. It's affecting all of us. These contracts on these phones, they're just like whoops. All the people that lost their money at whoops. Um, we're agreeing to things we should we don't understand. Obama said that we don't have to do this. And it, and it ended for a long time. It's back again. I can't get on a bus because I don't use a phone. I can't do a lot of things that most people do. I can't do, oh, I can't go to a, a library now. I have my insurance, they want me to send my license to a company down to, because I forgot my password, my license to a company down in Texas. I'm not sending my license down to Texas so that I can get my, because I've been paying on insurance forever that now they won't let me change because a few months ago, the house, the apartment below me burned. Um, to, to use my apartment, uh, washer and dryer. I got to use a cell phone. I don't have a cell phone to go to a movies, to use a bus. I went to a, to try to get a job and I could not get a job in a lab that I am far more qualified for. I can't get it because I'm not on the internet. We've Thank got a problem in America. Should start right here in Lakewood. Should start right here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Next, Earl. Earl Borgert. Uh, greetings, council members. I am Earl Borgert and uh, I'm a Lakewood citizen. Um, this year I'm going to be 50 years old and during every single one of those years, I have had the same familiarity with the exact same spot, the exact same property on Clover Creek as I reside to today. Um, during my life, I've seen the creek evolve in different ways. Um, took a little boat down the waterfalls when I was a kid, and I was witness to the fish ladders that were installed on two fish ladders that were installed on my property um, some 30 years ago. And then um, also saddened by the day that, you know, came home when my uncle lived there and he picked me up from the airport and there was a hundred foot length of PFAS foam that was a hundred feet long, 35 feet tall, <laughs> and was incredible. I have never seen anything like that to this day. 
And all of that chemical still resides in the banks of that creek. Um, I have read over these different proposals and I am not in interest of a levy being put, you know, to further create any problems that are going through the creek. Um, what interests me about the creek is cleaning up the creek for healthy drinking, healthy water, because of these PFAS chemicals are in our water. And also I pay taxes for waterfront property. And this year there was only six months of water. <laughs> and that is the lowest I've ever seen it in my entire life. So I don't really have any interest in paying an annual tax for waterfront property when it's going to decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease, especially by some of these different plans that are being proposed. And um, it's, I, I am just looking for alternative solutions to where the ecology of the creek needs to be addressed rather than it be diverted or something else to be creating another problem that we're going to have to deal with in the next years to come. Because this levy system will be creating another problem. It is, we're using an argument of a 1% chance of a flood. Well, there's a 100% chance of it being contaminated. And that needs to be dealt with before flooding needs to be dealt with. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Carol Colloran. My name is Carol Colloran and I live in Lakewood. Thank you, Mayor Whalen and City Council for this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, we are overwhelmed by homelessness locally and nationally, brought about by many factors. The blame game will not benefit human beings, nor will incarceration, nor shipping them out of our city, nor will continuing with the status quo be acceptable. Approximately 4,300 people are homeless in Pierce County, according to an official estimate by Pierce County Human Services in 2022. And three to 6% of these are in Lakewood. A chronic health condition is the most commonly reported disability. And 38% are female, 50%, 52% are people of color. Many unhoused people are hidden. They sleep in cars, in the woods, in vacant houses, or on couches. And um, targeting water pollution issues for shipping them out of Lakewood is a thinly veiled rationale for just getting rid of them. You are all innovative, smart, and compassionate people, and probably can come up with a better plan. A countywide plan to address the unhoused population is needed. Supporting the Pierce County Council's ordinance for the one-tenth of 1% 1 sales tax for housing and services is a more humane step than blaming the homeless people for water pollution and so shipping them to a shelter within a 15-mile radius. Many people, out of their compassion, donate to the nonprofit entities such as LASA, the Tacoma Rescue Mission, Salvation Army, et cetera, who are all helping the unhoused. But labeling those remaining on the streets in Lakewood as trash to be shipped away is not compassionate. And, and, and I don't have an easy solution, but, uh, and I know that it impacts everybody. Giving $1 million of ARPA money to LASA is great, as is using 1% of the city budget for housing, but certainly more services for the currently unhoused population are needed. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is the last name on the sign-in sheets, but that doesn't preclude anyone from joining us tonight during the public comment period. You just need to step up to the podium and give your name and you'll have your, your three minutes. So I see Ms. Minetti approaching. Welcome. Sorry, I didn't sign up. It's all good, as you know. Uh, Christina Minetti, Lakewood. Someone was recognized today in part for his efforts to help water the baby oaks that were planted to replace the original memorial oaks um, that were destroyed when I-5 was built. I've read about this before, and I, I read that the original oaks were northern red, scarlet red, and English oaks. 
That is to say, they're all non-native. They have nothing to do, they have nothing, no way of supporting our ecosystem here, our native ecosystem. While the ignorance may have been excusable in 1929 when it started, there is no excuse for this lack of foresight today. However, the problem is actually more serious than that. It would be, in fact, best if all of the English oaks that were planted, either in 1929 or more recently, were removed. And as you know, I'm a big tree lover, so I hate to say that, but it's true, because as members of the, of the white oak family, they're able to hybridize with the native Gary oak, and it's our only native oak, a keystone species. So this would destroy the genetic stock of our only native oak and keystone species and have knock-on effects in the ecosystem for all the creatures, insects, and plants and birds and animals who depend on this keystone species, Gary oak. A hybrid does not uh, provide the same habitat either as anyone who knows about hybridized native plants like rhododendrons and stuff, that birds and bugs and stuff, they don't like them. So um, a council member also mentioned to me that this would be a good opportunity to initiate the heritage tree program. I would ask that there be no recognition of recently planted non-native trees as heritage trees. I hope that you've all heard on a second topic, the news from the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change today. It's been called a final warning and also survival guide to avoid catastrophic warming. Experts say that we can avoid or cut 40 to 70% of projected 2050 emissions with things like shifting to plant-based diets, avoiding unnecessary flights, building less car-dependent cities. One expert who has participated says, it's the way we consume food, the way we protect nature. It's kind of like everything, everywhere, all at once. And this means that it starts with you two and us. We need local leadership to help indoctrinate, as some people would say, educate and move the people to act swiftly, discourage needless travel and street racing, encourage people to eat less meat and act decisively to truly protect nature of Lakewood. In light of all this, I'd like to ask that you, like Redwood, to, uh, Redmond, Tacoma, and more than 2,000 municipalities in 40 countries have done, declare a climate emergency, have a climate emergency proclamation um, as soon as possible. I'll leave the sample wording with the city clerk. It's just one. We, I can research it, see what are, if there are better ones. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I look forward to hearing from somebody about how we can go forward with this, with this proclamation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dunlop. My name is James Dunlop, and I am a Lakewood resident. I listened carefully to the new council member's selection interview. In his summing up, he committed to donating any 2023 salary from a position to benefit pediatric cancer patients. I think that's around $13,000. I should now point out that in Lakewood, incumbent city councillors hardly ever lose. I think the last election when an incumbent lost their seat was on November the 6th, 2001. So the new council member is potentially not going to have the costs of a candidate who actively contests a seat, and because of the incumbent's advantage, could enjoy 20 years plus as a city councillor, bringing in a combined income at today's level of well over $300,000. This raises the question of what is the true value of a city council seat, given the incumbent's advantage, the annual income, and the possibility of it being a stepping stone to higher elected office, perhaps fifty to dollars to $100,000. Maybe the city should have auctioned the vacant seat for charity. I suspect the auction would have raised far in excess of $13,000. But we all agree that such a process would demean the city council and disadvantage potential candidates who can't afford to make large donations or indeed can't afford to donate their salaries to a good cause. And given the fact that the final vote between the new council member and Todd Wolf was so close, we must consider the possibility that his offer of his 2023 salary made a difference in terms of applying moral pressure on those making the appointment decision. While I have no problem with the new council member giving his income to a charitable cause, I worry about him advertising his intention during the application process. 
In my opinion, he should have kept quiet about his intention, even if it reduced his chances of getting the seat. As Matthew chapter 6, verse 3 tells us, the left hand should not know what the right hand is doing. Given the situation, I ask that the new council member does a decent thing and resigns from the council. I also suggest that the council appoints the runner-up, Todd Wolf, in his place. That is the last individual I see approaching to address council during the public comment period. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address council during the public comment period? There's somebody, oh, we have some other hands raised. So I guess we're jumping back to virtual comment, which is my discretion to do, but let's do it. Christine Green, and let's see, Greg Takamoto first, it looks like on top. Followed by Christine Green and then an unidentified number. Hello, this is Greg yes. Dockmo. Um, I live in Shelton, Washington. I'm calling to talk about the property my sister talked about earlier on 9222 Hipkins Road. The first that I heard about this was on the 9th, that's 11 days ago. It's not enough time to come to, it's just not enough time. I have talked to Heidi and Brian and Troy. I think that we can come to an amicable um, agreement without litigation. Uh, and I'm not asking as we get 30 or 60 days to do that, uh, as I'm uh, apparently to the RCWs, I should have been notified at least 15 days in advance of this hearing. I haven't had that. So I just request that we postpone this for 60 days, 30 days, and let me get together with my siblings, with Heidi, Brian, and Troy, and come to an agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Christine Green. I'm sorry. Um, I'm Christine Green. I'm Greg Takamoto's spouse. And I'm just concurring that the first notice we had received was on March 9th. Uh, the following day, he called and spoke with Brian and then met with Brian the day after that. There just hasn't been enough time to property to properly evaluate the property at 9222 Hipkins and how it's going to detract from the property. Thank you. Madam Clerk, any others with virtual hands raised? Mayor, we have Al Schmouter. Mr. Schmouter, you're on. Mr. Schmouter, if you can unmute yourself, please. Yeah, I'm trying to. Are we there now? You're there. You're there. Okay. I guess this is the right time to talk about uh, uh, the Director of Public Works presentation later in the meeting. This is your shot on any matter related to city business, sir. Okay. Well, um, I'm the stewardship chair of the Chambers Clover Watershed Council, and I'd like to support your decision tonight to delay approval going forward of the flood plan. Um, there's no need to, need to rush it. It's not, there's no imminent problem, and it's not a big problem. According to the, the last flood we had, it was just called nuisance flooding in Lakewood. Anyway, a shortage of water, like Mr. Bogart pointed out, is the real problem. Uh, good, good flood planning is not happening in Lakewood. The, the three good ideas, the three ideas which were to protect the floodplain and preserve it and not build in and use Mother Nature's floodplain, Three options involving floodplain protection were discarded. They were considered, but they were not 
considered uh, adequately. So instead, to cause the demise of the natural floodplains was selected along with a mile of levees. Levees are costly, require maintenance, and can fail. Groundwater can rise up on the wrong side of the levee and then you are messed up. Regional solutions should be considered and they were not. Uh, mm -hmm. It's interesting that the funders of this, uh, that uh, funding for this, pro for this uh, development to kill the wetland, kill the floodplains and put up levees is, is being supported by developers who would like to get their hands on that property and they would like to even provide financial support compared, according to the study. So please delay the floodplain uh, plan uh, until more analysis is done. Um, and plans should include protecting Mother Nature's floodplain and use it to infiltrate water during the winter, along with floodplain protection during the summer. So a lot of good ideas are not being, not being properly evaluated. A tiny amount of citizens were involved in this process. Paul Busich told me, he says they can't get people to come out they had 40 here and 20 there. So people are not involved with this. They don't know what's going on. And guys like Paul, like uh, Mr. Bogart, he's not going to want his land torn up to put levees along the creek. So there's a lot more discussion that needs to happen here. And I would hate to be Mr. Busich and go to the funding, funding uh, sources uh, like, like FEMA and, and the State Ecology and say, hey, I, I want to kill the, fl the floodplain. I want to put up levees. I'm going to put 100% of the water right down the creek. They're going to look at Mr. Busich like, what are you smoking, man? This is not going to help our situation. You're going backwards. Let's get some, some coordinated planning going. Let's work with Pierce County. There's options to make this a regional program, not just a, the water doesn't, doesn't originate in Lakewood. Lakewood's trying to prob, solve the problem. They need to talk with Pierce County, look at regional issues to solve it, and work together, especially with the Department of Transportation. They got some money. We're not doing that. We're cutting it too short. There's no rush. So let's delay this thing till we can do it right. Thanks. Thank you. That is the last individual with a virtual hand raised during the public comment period. Anyone else? Going once, going twice is your shot. Mr. Lorisell, welcome to public comment. It is now closed. Madam Clerk, we now turn to the consent agenda, please. A, approval of the minutes of the City Council study session of February 27, 2023. B, approval of the minutes of the City Council special meeting of February 28, 2023. C, approval of the minutes of the City Council special, meet, special meeting of March 1, 2023. D, approval of the minutes of the City Council meeting of March 6, 2023. E, motion number 2023-29, authorizing the execution of an agreement with Burt Consulting in the amount of $91,350 for a statewide military spouse employment study. F, motion number 2023-30, authorizing the execution of an agreement with Hender Works Inc. in the amount of $90,000 for the diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan development. G, motion number 2023-31, authorizing the execution of an agreement with Stowe Development and Strategies in the amount of $58,500 to conduct a tax increment financing analysis for the downtown subarea. H, motion number 2023-32, approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Town of Stillicum for animal control services. I, motion number 2023-33, approving an intergovernmental agreement with the city of DuPont for animal control services. J, motion number 2023-34, authorizing American Rescue Plan Act funding in the amount of $50,000 for the Springbrook Connections office space and operational support in 2023. K, motion number 2023-35, approving the execution of a collective bargaining agreement with the Lakewood Police Management Guild through December 31st, 2027. L, motion number 2023-36, appointing Darren Lowry to serve on the Community Services Advisory Board through December 15th, 2026. M, items filed in the Office of the City Clerk. One, Lakewood's Promise Advisory Board meeting minutes of February 2nd, 2023. And two, Planning Commission meeting minutes of February 15th, 2023. Thank you very much. Is there any item on the consent agenda which a council member wishes to remove at this time? If not, do I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda as presented? So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. It's been moved by Deputy Mayor Moss and seconded by Councilmember Anderson that we adopt the consent agenda as presented. Any further discussion? 
All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda has been adopted. We now move to the regular agenda, Madam Clerk. Ordinance number 781, vacating that portion of 113th Street Southwest lying west of the westerly margin of Kendrick Street Southwest within the flat of Kendrick Edition. Thank you. And for this, we'll call on our associate civil engineer, Mr. Frank Sawatsky, to help us take a look at this. It starts on page 159 of your packets. Good evening, council members. Uh, I know we have a full agenda. I will try to keep this brief. A vacation uh, request was presented by Steve Borman, representing Washington and Rice LLC. A uh, portion of right away has been identified as 14,051 square feet in size, plus or minus, as surveyors always do, and abuts parcels um, 064, 010, 020, and 167, all of which are owned by Washington and Rice LLC. So we have a situation where all abutting properties are signed on for this vacation. Uh, the right-of-way was acquired by Pierce County more than 25 years ago. The staff is recommending the applicant pay the, to the city $340,000, mm -hmm. which represents the full appraised value uh, according to LMC 1212-160 and appraisers. Uh, we have the full legal description, which has been presented. And the only update to the staff report was that on March 6th, 2023, the City of Lakewood Council conducted a public hearing per resolution number 2023-02. Uh, Frank Swatsky, myself, representing Public Works Engineering, presented the petition, the staff report, and supporting documents. Council opened the floor to public comment and no objections were presented. The other update is that there are utilities in this area, so a easement shall be maintained until an agreement is made between the future owners and the utility companies to remove said utilities. Very good, sir. Any questions? Okay. Is that it? I didn't mean to cut That's you off. That's it. That was it, okay. That's the abbreviated form. Very good. Any questions to Mr. Swaski? So this appears to me to be an old uh, right of way to nowhere, right in the middle of this development, right? Kind of. Yes, sir. It it backs up to the reverse, the east side of St. Clair Hospital. Mm -hmm. So there's no chance of it going through at any time without a the city taking lands away. And St. Clair obviously has not objected. They don't see it as a necessary access way. Great. They, they are not using it. Great. Okay. If there are no additional questions, then do I have a motion to adopt Ordinance 781 as presented? Move to adopt Ordinance 781. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Brandsetter, seconded by Councilmember Bell, that we adopt Ordinance 781. Any further discussion? Mr. Brandsetter. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I. I'm certainly in favor of the ordinance, and I just wanted to to comment that this is in furtherance of a hope for inertia in the sub area plan where this is located, which is because because it's designed to facilitate. Um, units of, 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 of housing that are there. And so uh, the, 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 I appreciate that the property owner assembled the parcels uh, and has gone through and has, has a plan that is very consistent with our vision for that area as, as, as a sub area plan is going forward. And uh, it's, uh, it's good to see that the plan is developing some, some some movement in the direction that we want. Any further comments or discussion? The three hundred and forty thousand of the appraised value does that go back to public works or just to the general fund? Um, I would have to defer on this one. 
I'm Mayor Whalen, members of the council, it goes back into the Public Works CIP program. Got it. For further capital improvement projects, then good. Okay, very good. In the absence of any further items of discussion, all those in favor of Ordinance 781 signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 781 has been adopted. We now turn to Ordinance number 782. Ordinance number 782, amending Lakewood Municipal Code Chapter 9.06 related to the use of controlled substances. Very good. I'll call on our Assistant City Attorney, Samantha Johnson, for this particular matter to give us a brief overview. We had the pleasure of Ms. Johnson's attendance and presentation during the study session. So this is not necessarily new information to us. Ms. Johnson. Correct. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and members of the Council. Uh, so tonight you guys have before you the ordinance in order to adopt for the open use of dangerous drugs in public places. Uh, we were here on March 13th last Monday in open study session to discuss the provisions of the ordinance and the intent behind the ordinance. There have been a few changes made based off of our discussion. Uh, centrally, we included a few of those examples that were proposed with public spaces to include libraries, commercial businesses, and bodies of water. Additionally, after discussion, uh, we did, it is presented to be a gross misdemeanor, so it's a different class. Uh, there's misdemeanors, gross misdemeanors, and then felonies. This does set us apart from our neighboring cities that have adopted similar ordinances as there they are misdemeanors. So in my understanding, we will be the first city to have these ordinances as gross misdemeanors. It does increase the potential penalty. However, it does not invite new legal challenges uh, just based on the class that it's in. Um, I'm available for any further questions if you would have them. Yes, thank you, Mr. Boki. Thank you, Mayor Whalen. So let's go back to that point on gross misdemeanors and misdemeanors. What's, what's the, for people like me who are not attorneys, what does that mean? Yes, yeah, so a misdemeanor has a maximum penalty of 90 days in jail and a $1,000 fine. A gross misdemeanor has a maximum time in jail of 364 days and a $5,000 fine. Uh, they are both not felonies, uh, but it just increases the potential drug time, uh, not drug time, jail time and fine that can be imposed. So explain, explain to me as the prosecuting attorney, how, how do you make that delineation between whether or not you're going to charge somebody with a gross misdemeanor or a misdemeanor? So we can only charge as the laws exist. So if it's passed today as a gross misdemeanor, I can't charge it as a misdemeanor. It will be set into law. Uh, if your question has to go to penalties that would be assessed when to determine what amount of jail that would come down to prosecutor discretion and policies within the department. And, and I would, and I would know that when, it, when these used to be felonies, um, felony means possibly more than one year in jail, meaning they go to prison. That would be at the county and then at, on the, on the county's dime while they're here and on the state's dime when they're in prison. Now we may be on the hook for somebody for a year in jail and we have to pay for it, correct? Correct, if that was the ultimate goal uh, or that the ultimate sentence that they received. Okay. It would be the city of Lakewood's financial burden. Okay, thank you. Just a quick question about um, any unintended consequences on the prosecutorial side with the greater potential charge as a gross misdemeanor versus a misdemeanor? Not in my opinion, no. Okay. I, I'm sorry. Oh, Ms. Wachter. The deputy mayor was insistent that I call on you. <laughs> okay. Any further questions of Ms. Johnson? If not, do I have a motion to approve ordinance 782 as presented? I uh, move to adopt motion ordinance number 782. I'll second. It's been moved by Councilmember Anderson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Moss that we 
adopt ordinance 782 as presented. Any further discussion? Mr. Brandstetter. Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'm certainly supportive of, of this ordinance. It's, uh, it, it, it addresses both uh, uh, a need in the community and uh, addresses a void that uh, we don't seem to have been able to get filled uh, at the state level. And so we, we need to be able to uh, move forward so that in the city of Lakewood, we can um, make uh, some efforts to uh, reverse the trend of ever increasing uh, use of illicit drugs given the uh, much publicity that we've had about societal uh, things to do that. Um, th that that being said, um, I uh, would uh, like to uh, offer an amendment uh, to, to the ordinance by inserting a one additional whereas uh, in 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 the ordinance that uh, and and I and I would look to insert it uh, as the fifth the fifth whereas in in the sequence of the doing all that. And I would move to add to the ordinance that whereas undeterred public use of illicit drugs in public places creates a perception that such behavior is acceptable and normalizes the, the, the illicit drug use, particularly in the eyes of youth. And I, cause I think that's an important uh, foundation for one of our reasons of why we should do this. So there has been an amendment, amendment. I'll second that. Pronounce my syllables here tonight. It's been uh, moved by council member Brand Center and seconded by council member Boki that we amend the ordinance slightly to add a, an additional whereas as presented by council member Brandstetter. I hope our parliamentarian will be able to obtain the wording from the record. Uh, what we will do, mayor and members of the council, is we'll go back to the recording and we will put it into the ordinance as it was worded by council member Brandstetter, unless any member of the council before voting would need it repeated back in order to vote. I don't see a need to do the wordsmithing during the meeting. I certainly got the gist of it, and I think it's a fine amendment as proposed. Mr. Anderson, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll support this. I just uh, would comment for the benefit of our new council member that uh, a whereas does not become part of the code. So it, it's an expression of rationale. Of, of, pardon? A rationale. Yeah, it's, it's an explanation of why you did it, but it's not part of the code. Very good. So I believe, remind me if not, that we have a motion and a second for adoption of the amendment to Ordinance 782. Any further discussion on the proposed amendment, adding the whereas? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. We now turn to Ordinance number 782 as slightly modified by amendment. Any further discussion? Mr. Anderson. I just like to comment that uh, Lakewood is being called out as a jurisdiction with common sense for addressing this and our, our later uh, ordinance that we're considering. Uh, presently, the non scientific uh, television poll in Seattle is running 91% in favor, five and 4% yes, depending on how it's written. Uh, and so uh, there may be 
vocal enablers out there uh, that are opposed to these ordinances, but uh, that's not the way the public feels. Mr. Boki. Yeah, I'll also be supporting the ordinance. I do have concerns um, about the long-term fiscal impact of the gross misdemeanor. I think that there's a reason that other cities haven't done gross misdemeanors because they don't want to be paying for these guys to be marking time in jail for 365 days. So um, we'll leave it to prosecutor discretion, but I had a prosecutor tell me years ago that he said, you know, the impact on misdemeanors is the first month. Really after that, they're just marking time. So um, we, we need to be smart in, in how we do this, but I do, I clearly, uh, no disagreement from me that we need a tool to begin to do something that the state has abandoned, right? They, they've abandoned the field on this and um, the cities are being asked to step up. And so that's now a cost that we're gonna have to take on because the legislature has decided that they, they don't wanna do it anymore. So I'll be in support. And on that comment, I'll ask a question of our prosecutor. Does the opportunity for a lengthier sentence with a gross misdemeanor provide an enhanced opportunity for better diversion and possible treatment of the individual charged with the crime? Well, what I'll say to that is that, you know, you have that whole sticking carrot analogy. If there is a carrot that somebody can chase and what is the stick if they don't chase after it? If you have a 90 day maximum jail sentence, Sometimes 90 days looks a lot better than getting clean. They would rather do 90 days in jail than get off of whatever drug. But you start talking 364 and it sounds a lot different. Um, I know that this court, uh, particular in Lakewood, is searching for community court options, therapeutic court options, and these types of charges would fall squarely into that. And I'm certainly, uh, me and my specific position as the city prosecutor, I'm not interested in putting someone in jail for a year without court intervention and opportunity for treatment. So I do respect the comments. It is expensive. Uh, but the other goal outside of just a tool for law enforcement is court intervention for treatment. And this ordinance will get the folks that need help into the courthouse where it can be ordered. Thank you. Councilmember Bell, did you have anything? Thank you, Mayor. I would just also like to say that I'm in support of this and I do believe that the end goal would be to get people the support that they need and the resources they need and that we are not looking to put people in jail for 365 days. Um, I also am too concerned, uh, like Councilmember Boki, about the gross misdemeanor and that the fiscal impact of that. So I do think that'll be something we'll be looking at um, to see how that goes out, but thank you. I'm certainly going to echo my support uh, for the fine work that staff has put into this to, to bring this to council for review and consideration. I also am supportive of the change from misdemeanor to gross misdemeanor for the precise reasons articulated by Ms. Johnson. I think it's a stronger uh, carrot and possibly stick to encourage the behavior which we hope is a productive outcome of this law. And that is not just to criminalize uh, open drug use, but to attack it at its root cause and to get treatment for those who, who are willing to take that carrot, recognizing that if they don't, we do have a stick opportunity available as well. So I'm really hopeful that this uh, becomes a model for other jurisdictions and uh, illuminates Lakewood as a leader uh, for its residents, the business community, as we heard during public comment today, and certainly for those who are suffering from addiction, because we are serious about it and we're not going to allow it on the streets and in open use where youth are impacted and other community members are impacted. So thank you for your work. Okay. Any other discussion items? Deputy Mayor Moss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I too am in support of this ordinance. I think if we, what we are offering is support. We're trying to help them to get off the drugs that they're on or whatever the problems are. And I think the time allotted will be sufficient to help them, at least if they really want the help, but help them to get the help that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all in favor of ordinance 782 as amended, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Ordinance 782 as amended has been adopted. We now turn to Ordinance 783, Madam Clerk. Ordinance number 783, creating Lakewood Municipal Code Chapter 9.15 related to the occupation of public property. Very good, and for this, we have our own city attorney, Ms. Wachter. Good evening, Mayor Whalen, Deputy Mayor Moss, and members of the council, Heidi Wachter, city attorney for the city of Lakewood. You've previously considered this ordinance at the October 24th meeting, and then again at the last study session. And I should clarify, October 24th was also a study session. And what you have before you reflects the comments and uh, input from that meeting. We have clarified uh, what a public entity is over that time. We have clarified the definition of store. And I believe that took care of all of the comments that the council had. I would be happy to try and answer any questions you may have before you take action on this ordinance. Very good. Any questions of Ms. Walker at this time? Mr. Anderson. Move adoption. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Anderson and seconded by Deputy Mayor Moss that we adopt Ordinance 783. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Brandstetter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have some reservations about the ordinance um, that uh, I, I don't doubt that there is that it addresses a problem that there is a need to be addressed. Um, I, I am concerned that whether we're moving too quickly uh, before we have really cemented any relationships with some potential sheltering locations. I looked at the list of Pierce County shelters that was provided to us uh, today. And uh, there are quite a few, but they're not all no barrier shelters. Uh, some are only looking for families. Um, some it's not really clear they have an application and there's a third party organization that you have to get a referral to. I did note that there is one shelter for single individuals that is run by the Salvation Army. And the, it noted that they have actually contracted to where they are you operating that shelter to provide beds for individuals that essentially are um, where the referring agency is the Puala Police Department. They're, they're essentially they have, they're, they're essentially looking to be supportive of a program similar to what we would like to have here, being able to to go and do that. So I'm so I'm concerned of that 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 it's going to take some time to be able to get this in place and build the the relationship with enough shelters to do that. I note that the, the, the ordinance brought before us today uh, changed the uh, geographic um, distance uh, that a shelter can be located from the city hall and reduced it to something that I think is going to be more likely to be agreeable to someone who is homeless here 15 miles is a lot less than 30 miles and 15 miles is almost always certainly within a transit uh, ordinance. Uh, I also think that, uh, that our timeline is very short because we have crafted the ordinance for all public properties um, yeah, with, uh, with, with some, some exclusions uh, and that um, we haven't really done all of the outreach with all of the public entities that own such such property to be able to do that, and it will take us it will take some time to get that in place. So, so so although I have some 
concerns, I am willing to support the ordinance, but I would like to, 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 to make an amendment to be sure that our police department, that our staff and that before we begin to use it are fully done all of the preparatory things that I think are necessary to have it get off on a firm footing. And so, you know, I, I, I would move to amend section 12 to read that this ordinance shall be in full force and effect 60 days after publication of the ordinance summary. That moves it from 30 to 60. Um, and, and as and, and that and that is uh, consistent with the suggestion that the mayor made at the last time we discussed this. Thank you, Mr. Brandstetter. Is there a second to the motion to amend section 12? I'll second it. Okay, it's been seconded by Council Member Boki that section 12 be amended to provide for a, an effective date 60 days as opposed to 30 after publication of the ordinance summary. Any further discussion on this point? Mr. Brandstetter, let him speak to his okay. motion. And, Mr. And, and, and I would just say that that additional time is going to allow us to implement this, I think, much more effectively. By passing this ordinance, we are signifying that to the community that we're, we're, we're looking to get this addressed, being able to go and do that. But if we make it effective before we're really got done all of the homework to be able to go. We may not be meet the short term expectations of, of, of the public. Well, and we have a new police chief and, and, and some other things. And so I think there is a groundwork to be made before we ask our police officers who are most of this is going to fall on. Uh, to do the implementation of this. Mr. Anderson. I'm opposed to the motion. Things like this have been delayed too long. The present trajectory of the uh, leasing and management of uh, habitual homelessness on the streets um, has been one of delay, additional funding and acceleration of the problem. There is empty space in homeless shelters every night. The people we're talking about that would be most subjected to this ordinance are people who refuse to go in because there is no way to force them in to either shelter or into treatment. Uh, there is space there. It can be found merely by contacting coordinated entry for the county through Tacoma Rescue Mission, through uh, Catholic Community Services Associated Ministries. Um, and so I don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Uh, as far as reaching out to other public entities, this gives us a, under our general police powers over the jurisdiction, gives us authority to move people along on property that is not monitored by other public entities, whether it's uh, an owned property, whether it's an easement, uh, whether it's a play field, uh, you, we don't have to jump through hoops to approach the people who are there and offer them the opportunity to be sheltered. Uh, very simply put, it's help, or, help the highway or jail. And um, this is what the vast majority of people in our community want. And I don't think we should delay any further in putting it in, into effect. Any further comments on the proposed amendment to section 12? I'll speak to it just briefly. I, I echo Mr. Anderson's comments. I think, uh, I don't believe that staff would have put this much effort, time and energy into this if they didn't believe they were ready 
to fully implement this as indicated in the proposed ordinance 30 days after approval and publication as required by law. For me, it's also consistent with ordinance 782 that we just passed, which is also a 30 day implementation uh, period. And so to me, it's kind of uh, hand in hand what we're trying to accomplish here. So I'm going to vote against the amendment. It's well meaning. I certainly appreciate that. But I think staff is ready. If the city manager needed more time, he'd tell me. Correct, sir. All those in favor of the amendment to ordinance 783, that being changing the language of section 12 from a 30 day to a 60 day implementation signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Nay. Aye. I think we had one, two, three, four, five nays. So the nays have it. We are now to ordinance 783 without amendment. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Ordinance 783 has been adopted as presented. Thank you. We now turn to ordinance 784. Madam Clerk. Ordinance number 784, authorizing the acquisition of real property under threat of condemnation or by condemnation for road purposes, authoring, authorizing payment thereof from the city's general fund or from such other monies that the city may have available or attain for the acquisition, providing for severability and establishing a, an effective date. Thank you very much. And for this, we are calling on our city attorney, Ms. Walker. And before you present, I'll just encourage you to also address some of the comments we received tonight during public comment about the notice, the requirements by law for notice, et cetera. Correct. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, members of the council. I am still Heidi Walker, your city attorney, and you are still our city council. Um, specifically, uh, the notice element about a condemnation. So. When we embark on condemnation, we go on a statutorily proscribed process. There's nothing discretionary about it for us. We follow it like a recipe. We go through the steps that are statutorily required and the notice is included there. The downside of notice for the average person who may not have been through processes that have statutorily prescribed notice is that it's not actually about what the recipient knows. It's about whether or not the city followed the process. And that's very frustrating if you feel like you didn't know. But if we relied on what people thought they knew or didn't know, the process would probably never be complete. Having addressed that piece of this, I will tell you that we followed the statutorily prescribed process and there are some people who are frustrated that they didn't feel like they got notice. What I will tell you is, this is speaking as an attorney talking about a condemnation process because it's not warm and fuzzy and it's not always feeling good to the people receiving it. When you delay the process, you go back to square one and you start over again. Mm -hmm. And so if we embark on the process, which we've properly done here, we now know that the people are aware of what's going on. We're not required to go through full litigation. We're not all now required to show up in court and try this thing. The agreement that's been referenced in the public comments can still be reached without delaying this process. It feels a lot like pressure to the people that are now having to come to the table. But my advice as your counsel is that if we delay the process on the theory that we're then going to reach an agreement, for whatever reason, if that agreement doesn't come fast enough or doesn't seem to be evolving, we are starting all over again. And you think, well, we've got lots of time for that. I think if you asked your public engineer, they would tell you that they work on schedules and um, continuances sometimes increase the cost to the city. They sometimes jeopardize other parts of the project because they're really choreographing quite the dance out there to put together curb, gutter, sidewalk, whatever it is in a particular instance. I believe in this instance, it's a roundabout and this is the last holdout property. Um, I'm gonna look back. Yeah, I'm getting a nod and I never get a nod from the engineers. So I must be in line with what they're thinking. 
I would be happy to try and answer any other questions you may have. I know it it's not always comfortable to tell somebody, look, this is how this process works, but it, it really is. And my best advice is that we keep this in place, not because we're all going to end up in a courtroom. We'll probably get to the agreement that these folks have rec recognized in their comments. Um, and then we don't go to court. We can drop this at that time. We're not required to proceed the whole way through. This is just seeking the declaration for the public use and necessity order. Correct. And what that would mean is that um, we get to put the project in before we actually get to the part of what the value is going to right. be. And the, so the that also is later. frustrating to yeah. people because they don't realize that we don't even have to get through the whole court hearing before we get the use of the, of the piece. Thank you for the overview. Any further questions of Ms. Walker, Mr. Anderson? Ms. Walker, I, as old attorneys are wont to do, check <laughs> the court files, and it appears that the property is actually owned by an estate that was uh, filed and letters testamentary issued in 2015, but it's never been, the probate's never been completed. That is consistent with my understanding of an underlying situation. And I have had a side conversation with our outside counsel, Kenan Williams. We've not brought him in on this specifically, but if this starts to look like something other than garden variety, eminent domain, we would certainly bring him in. He's considered pretty expert in that area. I'm more interested in the, you know, the notice aspect of that individual. It wouldn't be necessarily required to give notice to individuals that were not owners of That's the property correct. if the estate got notice, isn't that correct? That is correct, um, Council Member Anderson. And I can tell you that uh, to my knowledge that I have not researched particularly, but based on the calls I've received, there are several um, family members involved in that situation. And so it's distinctly possible that some of them would not have received what they consider to be adequate notice. Thank you. Any further questions? Do I have a motion to adopt Ordinance 784 as presented? Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. No, I move adoption of uh, Ordinance Number 784. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Boki, seconded by Councilmember Anderson that we adopt Ordinance 784 as presented. Is there any further discussion? Ma'am, we're in the middle of a motion here, and afterwards, council, uh, certainly staff will be in touch with you. You, you had your opportunity during public comment, ma'am. All those in favor of adopting Ordinance 784 as presented, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Ordinance 784 has been adopted. We now turn to unfinished business. Mr. Caulfield, any? There is none, Mayor. Any items of new business? Not this evening, Mayor. And we'll turn to reports by the city manager. The well, thank you, Mayor, and good evening again, Council. Um, first, I'd like to uh, call upon our Public Works Engineering Director, Paul Busish, to give you uh, an update and review the Clover Creek Engineering Alternatives Evaluation Report. Very good. Busich. Thank you, Mr. Busich. Good evening, uh, Mayor Whalen, Deputy Mayor Moss. Tonight, I'm gonna to give you a briefing on the final engineering alternatives evaluation study done for the Clover Creek flooding um, that was determined to be greater than what was expected a couple of years ago. You know, click it, left it. Oh, thank you. So tonight we're gonna to talk about the project history I'm going to give you some discussions on alternatives that were under consideration, talk about the public outreach that was conducted, the alternative analysis on the four, and then the next steps in funding, engineering, and outreach. So if you may recall, uh, back in 2019, we determined that the original FEMA insurance mapping was in fact in error, that the more updated mapping we did showed that the FEMA floodplain, 100-year floodplain was considerably larger than what it uh, was 
in the 2017 study. We decided to do some additional investigation on what kind of alternatives might be to mitigate the flooding because we determined at that time that should we move forward with a, what's known as a letter of map revision that the floodway was now going to go across the freeway, which was very difficult to remove from FEMA's um, determinations or their future actions. Um, we are also completed that alternatives analysis, and I want to talk to you about how we're going to advance and design and secure funding. As a reminder, this is what the 100-year model flood event looks like. And you've heard from various individuals saying that I've never seen this, and they're right, they have never seen this. This is a 1% probability flood. It's not a 25-year flood. It's not a 50-year flood. It's a 1% probability flood, also um, known as the 100-year flood plain. Well, we determined that it was going to flood across uh, I-5 to the extent that it was going to shut down I-5 for two to three weeks. It was going to shut down Pacific Highway, uh, Bridgeport, 112th Street. It was more than likely going to shut down the Sounder, the Amtrak, any other train uh, traffic that moves through this corridor here. Most of the traffic that uses I-5 would, unlike, would, would very likely jump off and try to run through our city, either at Gravy Lake Drive or DuPont, and also on 512 to, again, go through and bypass this. Our city systems are not set up to handle this traffic. There are many businesses along Pack Highway that would be heavily impacted. Um, we have St. Clair Hospital, Taiyi Park Elementary, JBLM. I mentioned the Sounder, all of those would be heavily impacted. It would also um, necessitate that a lot of businesses that are currently viewed as outside of the 100 year floodplain, now being inside the 100 year floodplain, would be required to get insurance coverage unless they happen to own their business and property outright. They don't have a lender. Most lenders do not like businesses or homes or structures in the floodplain at risk without having some form of flood insurance. And flood insurance has uh, gone up considerably over the last um, five, 10 years. One of the other things that this would do for the community is the area in the Springbrook um, between Clover Creek and I-5 that has been designated for industrial uses as a part of the city's vision for improving the economy and more jobs that would remain basically undevelopable or limited development that could be accomplished in there. Limiting our future growth. So when we looked at the alternatives and we did evaluate uh, approximately 20 different alternatives, including Pierce County solving the problem for us, because let's face it, we're on the downstream end of Clover Creek. We didn't generate the water that's causing the problem, but we're the recipients of it. Part of that evaluation looked at, like I said, over 20, and then we um, bucketed those into different categories and then windowed those down. Looking at uh, relying on Pierce County alone to solve this problem was determined to be highly unlikely. Um, they have their own problems. They spend a lot of their money on major river systems, and they had representatives at our stakeholder committee who were quite frank about the probability of them being able to solve this problem in the upper reaches of Clover Creek. So that being the case, we wanted to take our future in our own hands. We decided that that may be a long-term vision and a goal to continue to work with Pierce County to put in additional facilities upstream. It was not gonna solve our problem for us. And it was not gonna solve our problem in any form of a reasonable time frame. So we continued moving on and looking at the um, different alternatives, we looked at what are the community benefits, um, DE&I, what kind of disruption to the community would each one of these alternatives either have or reduce? Um, what about the impacts of emergency response, transportation, and structural flooding? We evaluated those under the community benefits. We looked at affordability. Would it require land acquisition? What would it cost to implement a solution? What about development potential and transportation disruption, business, residential building impacts? We looked at the implementation ease. How easy is this going to be to do? What kind of um, mitigation and or flood reduction would the alternative provide for us? Uh, what kind of community enhancement potential is there? If we were to build something, can we make it so it's a community asset and not any kind of an eyesore? Can we blend it into Springbrook Park? Can we blend it into other features that we have. 
we looked at the time to full implementation, and this was our best estimate based upon the expertise sitting around the table. I should mention that we had quite a few people, and I'll talk about that in a minute, experts in the fields and regulatory agents, agencies sitting here doing this with us. We looked at uh, environmental impacts. What about water quality? What kind of fisheries benefits? What about wetland enhancements could a project do for us? <clears throat> We looked at what's the damage to the city infrastructure from prolonged inundation? What's the potential for loss of life due to flooding? What's the uh, likelihood of reduced mobility from and to essential services, fire, EMS, police, hospital? We looked at all these things in consideration and a few more. We also looked about what about elderly and pe people with special needs? How would uh, the flooding and how would the alternatives actually help us in those categories? So we looked at an awful lot of issues. We ended up with four top four alternatives because it is likely that anything we do um, any, as far as grant funding pursuits would require us to look at the do nothing. The do nothing says, OK, if we do nothing. That's a viable alternative. We can do that. What would be the impacts on that? Any any federal entity that we're going to go after funding would require us to look at the do nothing. So we have something to compare with. We determined that in the do nothing alternative, we could look at an economic impact of about $90 million and physical damage and loss of city future revenue of about 40 million. So about $130 million is what the do nothing alternative means when the flood comes through. We looked at the possibility of doing channel and capacity enhancements. What can we do without building any, any physical structures like a levee or a flood wall? Can we go out there and enhance the carrying capacity of the channel? Can we do some wetlands improvements? Can we do something, um, uh, fish ladder removals, things like that that would benefit? And what we determined was that most of the existing area south of I-5 would still be in the floodplain. So it would have some benefit, don't get me wrong, but it would not solve the problem um, that we may be looking to do out here. We should be doing. It does protect I-5 and businesses west of I-5, but much of that area east of I-5 will still flood. We look at a simple I-5 levy. How about if we looked at what it would take just to protect I-5, what would it do? And we, we were able to scope that out and lay it out and model that and determine that we could build a levy within partly DOT right away, as well as coming down to tie from the I-5 corridor over to 47 to high ground. And that would prevent the flooding from crossing the freeway and prevent the flooding north and west of the freeway. It would have about the same benefit as building the in-stream channel work. In other words, everything from I-5 to Clover Creek would still be flooding. It changes the nature of the flooding a little bit, but it's still flooded. And the last option is the most robust. And you've heard some comments from folks about this. It is building a levee from basically Bridgeport along a corridor that would take it to high ground over by the railroad tracks, close to the JBLM. I'm gonna show you a graphic of where that could be, but as I have mentioned to many people over the last months, do not tell me that that's where you said it was going to be, so if you don't dare move it, or if you say it's gonna be there, it's gonna impact X, Y, and Z. This is the concept, it's a proof of concept. It's not gonna to be too far off more than likely, but it's a proof of concept. And what we determined that if we did that, that would protect I-5. It would protect all the homes and businesses on both sides of I-5. There would still be a small portion of land that would have flooding um, because buildings were built right next to the creek, not leaving a lot of room. So that is still something we would need to address as we move forward, should we choose to do that. So let's talk real quickly about the public engagement. There were 17 stakeholders. By stakeholders, I mean Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, Pierce County Flood Control Zone District, Pierce County Service Water Management, Fish and Wildlife. We had um, Pierce Transit, Sound Transit. We had a Department of Ecology representatives. We had representatives of the Puyallup Tribe and the Nisqually Tribe. And I'm sure I'm forgetting a few more. The purpose for this limited stakeholder was to find out if it's technically feasible to do something. And if we come up with an idea that cannot be permitted, then it is dead in the water. So we needed to find out from an engineering perspective and from a regulatory perspective, do we have a viable option? 
We did hold four of those stakeholder meetings where we discussed everything with these individuals. We got good feedback, but in general, there was nobody who said, now you shouldn't do any of this. These are folks who have worked with levee systems. They've worked with the river flooding. They've worked with fish and wildlife issues their entire careers. Um, they know what will work and what won't work. And when we ask them towards the end, okay, this is the direction we're going and this is the recommendation I'm going to make to city council. Do you have any problems with it? Do you see any issues? Is it, is it unpermittable? Is it going to cause any concerns? And overall, uniformly, they all said, nope. That's the best option and best solution you can come up with. So I'm comfortable that from a regulatory perspective, when we move forward, assuming council agrees with this, that we will have partners in making a final solution that will work. We did, did hold two community meetings. We sent out, I think the number was 670 notices to businesses and property owners within the area of study. And unfortunately, I don't know whether it's a sign of the times, but we had 13 to the first one and 14 to the next one. But there was also a neighborhood meeting from the racket club they invited us to come to, and we had 40 people there. So we have reached out to people. I've heard comments from some saying, I didn't know this was going on, and I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. You get the notice right to your house, and nobody pays attention to it. It's on our website, it's been social media, we've got a web page associated with this. Um, I wish I had a magic bullet to get public engagement, but we have this problem on everything we do as, as um, you know, in general, public works. People just don't believe us until the big machine shows up and starts taking things out. So we do have an, an interest to integrate various components of the different alternatives into a final solution. We do have a very strong interest in refining the process. This is proof of concept. This is not the final solution, it's not a 30% design. There will be lots of time for people to provide input and talk to us about alternatives. People wanna say, I've heard from some of the residents out there, you're gonna go build a really large um, dike levy. By the way, the correct term is levy, not dike as some people have said, it's a levy. And so in their backyard, but the reality of it is that for most of these people, it's going to be a relatively smallish berm or maybe a concrete flood wall that's a couple of feet high that runs a, a distance right along the creek. And it's only going to be effective when the creek is high. Other than that, it's going to be, it's going to be dry because we're talking about the 100-year flood, we're not talking about trying to contain a five-year flood into the creek and everything beyond that. So what it comes down to when we look at the four primary considerations and the four primary alternatives, the do nothing shines in implementation and cost. It shines because we don't have to do anything. And it doesn't cost us anything, but it also has the greatest economic impact of $120 million when the flood happens and the greatest amount of damage to businesses and properties. Moving all the way down between the next three, you can see that the costs, they're within percentages of each other. So really it's not gonna be about cost. It's gonna be what's the greatest bang for your buck and the greatest benefit and what's most important to the community. The levy alternative shown here, again, it's an approximate location, but you can see that all the floodplain basically disappeared on the other side of the levy. There are some pocket areas downstream that we will focus on to determine whether anything further needs to be done or whether that little bit of flooding that occurs is acceptable. In between Pack Highway and um, I-5, there's a parcel that has a portion of the property where it's deep, channeled well below the, the grade. A portion of that property would flood is undeveloped. More than likely at that point, we would talk to the property owner and say, we may want to buy that as opposed to building something really expensive to protect the un unbuildable or the, the small amount of buildable land on there, something yet to be determined. But as you can see, this is the one option that gives us the greatest value and bang for the buck. A little bit better representation, graphic representation. You can see how we're trying to use the levy to protect not only the buildable land, but also the built land. And you can see that there's one 
apartment complex really close to the creek. In fact, there's two, it's a little bit hard to see, it's closer to Bridgeport, but the big one is right there. Interestingly enough, that particular property in the flood scenario does not get flooded because it's been built up. Kind of strange, but that's where it is. You'll also notice, if you, if you recall these, most of the flooding, if not all of it, occurs on the right-hand side of the creek as you're looking downstream, not the left-hand side of the creek, because the ground goes up. So it's those folks over on the right-hand side that would see the impact. A lot of the property that is north and west of the freeway also, the houses aren't flooded, but the roads are. So your house will be high and dry, but you can't get in and out of it unless you got a big four-wheel drive truck. In which case, go really slow, please. I don't want to hear the complaints about washing all the beauty park and the storm drains. So our goal is to kind of eliminate all of that flooding. Is that the extent of the levee location predominantly? As we're looking at it right now, that's where the major levee would be approximately. There is some work that we'd need to do downstream and we would do that in conjunction with property owners to identify how much flooding would or would not be on their property and determine whether any additional work would need to be. But we don't wanna do is we don't wanna squeeze it here, keep the water in the channel and have it pop up, pop out downstream. That doesn't solve our problem. We also have to take a look at where all the existing storm drains discharge. Mm -hmm. If any of them discharge into the creek directly, then we need to make sure that the water is not going to back up from the creek and again flood the road. So there's engineering solutions to all of that. And from what I can see, I'm not an engineer, but none of this seems to impact the flow. It just directs it away from what I see as commercial development and I-5. There were public comments, obviously, they were concerned about putting anything in that might further dwindle the existing surface water flow through the basin. So one of the things that we will be paying attention to is you put a levee in, you want to make sure that the water that's on the other side can still get to the creek. So we have to make sure that any conveyances that go to the creek can get to the creek for every event other than the 100-year event. But then there's different engineering devices that you can put under the end of the ends of the pipe and other, other options you can use that will prevent the high flows from backwatering and flooding behind the creek, behind the levee. Um, this is not new science. This is not new engineering. It's a lot that's been done. We would just need to look to apply that, those solutions to this area here. The other thing I want to point out is this is a floodplain primarily because the creek has been relocated 100 years ago. It's a floodplain because the creek has been channeled in pretty much a confined nature. The creek cannot migrate. So it's an overflow floodplain. Other floodplains you may think about like the Puyallup River. Puyallup River passes 55,000 cubic feet per second. On a high flow, this is passing 550. The Puyallup River can tear apart levees that aren't engineered to be extremely robust. I mean, the size of the tow rock that goes in on the Puyallup River type of levee, literally for myself, the council member Anderson, it would go beyond the two of us, just one rock. There's some big rock that gets brought in. We don't have that situation. What we have is basically water that's coming up and going over top of the bathtub and it's flooding across your floor. And what we're trying to do is stop that and keep it in there. We will increase the flow during these events from about 530 to 550, 560 CFS. We will be looking to make sure that that increase doesn't actually damage the banks or damage the bed of the stream. But I have to reiterate, this is a one probably once in a one in a hundred or one percent probability event. This is not energy working on the creek every year. This is a, a once in a blue moon, but when it happens, it has quite a consequence. So we know that this is going to cost us a lot of money. So part of our strategy here is to look at where the money is going to come from. General and sense before is- Before we do that, I go... had a question real quick. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Busich. Yeah, I, for the uninformed, including me, I, I expect to know the answers to these questions generally, what you have considered just to make sure that there, people don't ask, I guess, so we don't have to inquire later sure. when we try to take action. We've been talking about the 1% or 100-year, commonly called the 100-year flood. 
what about the 2%, the 4%? Uh, and is there, ha, has a phasing of this been considered? For example, and, and I think this implied in your comments is that things like this have been excluded, but for example, instead of building a $30 million levy, is there an opportunity to build a $15 million levy and either only address a 2% flood, 50 year flood, or by doing so protect I-5, but not protect all the other properties so that something could be phased and we could get benefit as it grew and we could obtain this rather large amount of funding? So um, the answer is, it depends. So when you- Are you a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> it's Please a don't, don't. I'm an engineer, that hurts. Um, <laughs> can you design a levy that, that handles the 50 year flood? Yes. The 100 year flood levy that we would put in here will handle the 25, the 50, the 75 and the 100 year floods. Um, what I don't show you is that in the 50 years storm, there is flooding. There's still flooding. It just doesn't reach I-5. It will flood across. If you're going to build a levy, the amount of time and effort and money it's going to take to build a levy for a 50-year flood versus a 100-year flood, go for the 100-year flood. Because once you build a levy and you get a permit, the floodplain stays the same. We haven't done anything. FEMA regulates the 100-year flood. They don't regulate to the 50-year flood. So everybody who's out there would still have to have the flood insurance. When you hit a 100-year flood and overtops your levy, you have to make sure your levy is robust enough that it can handle that overtopping and not erode itself and destroy itself. Then let's say that you did that. Now you got a 100-year flood, the water overtops it. All the water's on the other side of the levy. Now what do you do? How are you gonna get the water back over? When you don't have a levy, okay, the water will flow across the land. As the creek flow drops, some of that water will migrate back into the creek. A fair amount of it won't just because of the topography that's out there. It will stay in kind of like a bathtub effect. So building something less than a hundred year flood protection is not something I would recommend. Can we build it in phases? Unfortunately for a levy, no, you can't. If you're gonna build a levy, you're gonna build a levy. Now, can you build pieces of it each year and assume the risk each year that there's a flood? Yes, you certainly can. But what we have to do is we have to get FEMA and others to agree in the Army Corps of Engineers who won't be funding it, but will probably um, give their stamp of approval on it. They have to agree to that kind of a strategy. I've never seen them do that. As expected, but thank you. Mr. Boki. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A uh, couple, couple, two or three questions here. First of all, um, on this slide, and you, you, you've highlighted the creek in green um, and the levee location in orange, the proposed or an idea about the levee location. There's clearly an apartment building um, on the right-hand side of the picture that's within the levee, between the levee and the creek. And then somebody is sometime allowed buildings to be built just north of the creek, right there by Bridgeport, which yes. seemed odd. I thought the creek actually went to the right of that. Explain that situation and would the intention in the long term be to buy out those properties? Those two areas were ones I had mentioned earlier and thank you for bringing those up again because what do you do with, with properties like that? Do you um, plan to acquire them? Do you look at them and say, what can we do to provide flood proofing right around the structure itself so the structure is safe? but maybe the drive coming up to it is not. If you put a levy in on 47th and it cuts across the top, we've got to get people over top of it to the other side back and forth because they live there. Mm -hmm. So raised road basically to go through there, or um, there are some flood walls that can be installed um, when you know the flood is coming or when you see it creeping up, you evacuate everybody, you put up a flood wall. There are engineering solutions to that. Are they the greatest? No. Um, typically, what you want to do is if there are structures in the floodplain, buy them out, move them out, tear it down. 
That's what Pierce County has been doing because they realize that building all these levees as expensive as they are for the river um, to protect one or two homes doesn't make a lot of sense. So they don't do that anymore. Most agencies do not. This is something we will need to evaluate to find out what we can do and how we can protect, or do we recommend that those properties be removed from the floodplain? Way too early to make a determination on that. And the creek over there by Bridgeport is in fact located correctly. There is um, a small apartment complex there. It's kind of hard to see through the trees, but it was undoubtedly permitted back in the good old days when things were allowed because the floodplains weren't modeled or well understood. So explain to me, I mean, I, I kind of live in this world where I see a lot of grant applications for fish passage barrier removal. Mm -hmm. Explain to me the situation. I mean, we just redid Bridport, Bridgeport, but we didn't do redo the bridge. The ability of water to flow through under Bridgeport and under I-5, are those... Um, are those a problem? Would they meet today's standards? Well, to say that? In, in two regards, yes, they do. The first one is they have the capacity to pass the flow through that. That's what the, the study shows. And the other part of it is what about fish passage? And they're not a blockage for fish passage, mm -hmm. either one of them. So if one of them was specifically on Bridgeport, which would fall under the city's um, purview, we would go after a, a grant to remove it, replace with something larger that wouldn't block fish from coming through. That's not the case here. The fish can get through no problem, as can the fish under I-5, which would be the State Department of Transportation's responsibility to correct. But right now, neither one of those locations appear to be a hindrance to the flow right now. As we do more additional engineering work, we may determine that one of them needs to have some additional improvements. What my experience has been also, I will share with you, is that a lot of times uh, when we go out, when I've gone out and looked at structures like this, um, I've discovered that they've had a um, significant lack of maintenance. And so when they are cleaned and maintained properly, then the water flows adequately like it should. There's just debris and silt and whatnot. It can be debris and silt. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Although Thank this creek doesn't have a lot of, of uh, silt buildup. Thank you. You're welcome. Moving on to funding. So this is going to be an expensive project. Um, we've looked at grants, state and federal grants that are out there, and most of them are focused on water quality or fish passage. Um, we really don't find any grants of any significance, maybe a half million there, a million dollars there that would help us on something like this. Now, there are new federal programs that we would very actively pursue. Um, we would even go after something like the DSIP as a possibility because we believe that this will significantly impact JBLM's military readiness when the freeway floods. Because you can't move any equipment or personnel up and down the I-5 corridor and you have a hard time getting people to get into the McCord Bridgeport um, gate. We also looked at the fact that, remember when I said that we looked at the, the levy to protect the freeway? And it's in about approximately the same range, just a little bit less for a full meal deal solution. So we would look to find out if there's a way to get uh, DOT or a direct allocation of some form from the state through the DOT. So we would also be looking at the Pierce County Surface Water Management and we're also looking at the Pierce County Flood Control Zone District. This project right now is going to be put into their list for the Flood Control, control Zone District. They're expanding their, their area of potential influence to include jurisdictional flooding problems. This is R1 for the City of Lakewood. So we might have an opportunity to pick up some money from them also. So this is going to be a series of pots of money we're going to have to go after. We're also going to be looking and talking to public-private partnerships. I already had one developer call me up and say, hey, I hear that you're advancing something. What have you got? And I told him, he said, well, if it comes down to $2.5 million more you need, just let us know. We'll fund it. Because the land is so valuable to build on, that what they can do out there now versus what they want to be able to do. 
And of course, we know that Pierce County owns the gravel pit, so I'm expecting them to cough up a good 10 million. Maybe not, okay. Um, but the point of it is that there's a lot of available land out there. There are property owners who would like to be able to maximize their revenue, their sale, their property. And we should be talking to them about, can you help make this thing a reality? I'm not looking to them to fund everything right now, but I think that it's fair to say if they're gonna capitalize and get a lot more money out of it, then maybe they should have some skin in the game and help the city of Lakewood solve this problem out here, which is imposed on us. Having more partners as we go forward on this will certainly look a lot better when we're talking to the state about some potential budget. Now, this next strategies I'm gonna go through with you, they are highly optimistic. They are based upon a 2025. If everything goes well in a perfect world, we might be able to be out there building in five years. The reality of it is, and I wanna set expectations, this is probably gonna be between five and 10 years out in the, in the best of all worlds. So this isn't something that we're driving to that we're gonna start building in two years time. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on this. We're gonna be talking about looking at grant programs, um, engaging our state and federal lobbyists, identifying any kind of uh, funding that for the business case, I think we've got a pretty good business case right now. Spend 20, $25 million, save $120 million in the outset. Um, the unrealized value to us is the redevelopment and development of land that currently is sitting fallow. No one can do anything with it. We'll be looking for securing letters of support as we go through this, and then seeing if 2025 we can get some allocations from the state. We may get allocations from the state for taking us to 30% design, 50% design, but we've got to continue to look as we move forward. Outreach and engagement, we have a strategy. Again, looking at a 2025 state budget cycle, we uh, will go out and start talking to individual property owners. We will need to survey the creek to find out which property owners are gonna be impacted by the flooding and then any levy that was built should we go that way. We need to identify key agency stakeholders and funders. I've been talking with the staff. So now the staff are fully informed. I know what they're gonna allow and not allow because they're the ones that actually write the permits. Now we need to start talking, we would need to start talking to their higher ups, the leaderships of the organization to get them to understand why this is important, but this is not just a Lakewood issue. This is a regional issue. It's not a Pierce County issue, it's a regional issue because when you shut down I-5, everyone's gonna suffer. Um, you can see the strategy we have in here for the, for the um, sorry, the stakeholder and outreach. And now we're gonna talk real quick about the technical. The technical, of course, for me is where the rubber hits the road. This is where we have to make the proof of, of the concept. We'll need rights of entry for doing some survey work along the creek. We'll need to do a habitat assessment of the creek to find out what's out there and what this is going to impact. There will be some geotechnical exploration along this proposed levee area after we have permission from property owners to go in there. Land acquisition easements, basis of design, 30% design, all of this is going to take some time. And then submitting permit applications. We would submit permit applications at 30%. Well, 30% isn't necessarily where we normally would submit um, permit applications, but this is gonna take that long. We will be dealing with the regulatory agencies over the course of 30, 50, 60, 90% until it's all final. They'll be giving us feedback and we'll be modifying the designs as we move forward from there. So next steps, where are we gonna go from here? I'd like to get the council's feedback on what you've heard so far and whether you concur the recommendation to continue to pursue a levy along the corridor. Exact location is yet to be determined. There'll be lots of time to come back and provide refinements and additional dialogue on that. We'll develop a scope of work for some consultants to assist us on the funding engineering outreach, as well as a technical advisory group. And then with council concurrence on the different um, scopes of work and budgets, et cetera, then we'll execute that and start moving forward into the next phase, which is a development of a 30% or at least a proof of concept in greater detail um, project. That was an awful lot to digest. I appreciate your patience tonight.
The report is finalized. It is on the city's website on the project. I did send you a shortened version of that because the full um, report is 130 megabytes, but I gave you also a link in the memo so you can go and read that at your pleasure and look at all of the graphics and then all of the work that went into development of that, which are all the appendices. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I, Mr. Brandstetter. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Mr. Busich. And obviously it's clear that a lot of effort has already been put into to the work on, on this. Um, I guess it, it, it seems to me that, that you, you, the project started with a goal of how do we mitigate a 100-year flood. Um, and uh, I guess it, how would what you, your work have been different if it had been uh, how do we manage Clover Creek? In terms of the you know, and 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 deal with it, uh, the Clover Creek, both of it, because we, you know we have, we we hear the, the the spectrum of concerns of low to no water. There is water. There are people who have years of memory that recall some flooding being able to go on that, but at the same time we deal with environmentally, we people about, well, um, we're gonna remove the dam down in Chambers Creek so that we can reestablish the, the salmon uh, movement, which would include salmon coming up through Lake Silicon, coming up Clover Creek to be able to do that. So, so, so how would the approach be different if we were looking to not just mitigate the flood and the, the impacts of a flood, but we were looking to manage the health of the creek and the uh, and the watershed, would we be looking at a different set of models with a different acceptable list of outcomes? I think the challenge here is that there are multiple issues with Clover Creek and they are not necessarily connected. So the low flows in Clover Creek, Clover Creek has gone dry for many decades. Is it getting worse over the years? Possibly. That water is coming again or not coming from Pierce County. It's complex issue. Um, would I be looking at something different if I was only looking at the base flows from the creek? Yeah, that'd be entirely different. If I was looking at improving the habitat in our portion of the creek, which by the way, if I might remind the council, I have a budget item of 125,000 this year to do a habitat assessment of Clover Freak Creek from Silicon Lake to JBLM. That was put in on purpose because we want to know what's going on at the creek. The creek is private and the city has no ownership of the creek. But under our surface water management, I believe we have the ability to look at what's going on and then make recommendations from a habitat improvement perspective. So that work was already proposed to be going. By the way, we would need to do that should we decide to move forward with any kind of a solution out here because we need to know what's out there, what are we going to impact, and how can we. How can we prevent the impact or mitigate the impact? The biggest challenge, though, that you bring up is what about the low flows? What about the low flows in Clover Creek? City of Lakewood can work with and has been working with Pierce County and Lakewood Water District to some degree, but the Lake Water District operates under their own um, requirements for extraction of groundwater, and that's from much deeper aquifers. Pierce County, um, basically their philosophy upstream is that they can dump it into the ground, they're dumping it into the ground. But for many decades, development occurred like it has here, that is hardened impervious surfaces and that discharges into the creek. 
but there's times a year when that water doesn't get here because it goes subterranean. Can't do anything about that, folks. I can't do anything about the fact that groundwater is infiltrating the ground. One of the blessings that we have in the city of Lakewood is we have highly infiltrative soils. So the development that does occur for the most part infiltrates all their water on site. It's a very complicated issue when we start talking about groundwater. Would I be doing something different here right now? No, because the issue for us right now is high flows, the floodwaters. What can we do or should we do anything to prevent the flooding that is forecast and predicted to come out of Clover Creek? I've not been tasked, nor am I asking to be tasked with, tasked with providing base flows in Clover Creek within the city limits because it's a fruitless event, uh, uh, adventure for us. That has to be either Mother Nature is going to take care of it or Pierce County is going to find some way to introduce more water into the creek and not have it disappear into the groundwater. We're already looking at the flooding. We're already looking at the habitat. The one piece that's missing, Councilman Ransetter, you've mentioned, and I've heard a lot of people talk about this, is the low flows in the creek. I don't know what to do about that. I don't think anybody does. I'm not sure how much of it can be influenced by human activity, um, how much of it is occurring because of climate change that we've encountered. I can't change that, none of us can. We can do our best, but that creek is gonna do what that creek is gonna do on low flows. There are times in the past where Clover Creek was asphalted because it was disappearing. That was 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Now the big movement is to remove the asphalt and turn it back to a natural condition. Okay, the water's gonna go into the ground because that's why the asphalt was put there in the first place. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but hopefully I did by telling you it's a complex system. Well, I look at it differently. Uh, you know, I understand that Clover Creek has a range of disconnected issues. Okay, um, and, and the, the study that you're presenting to us and the proposal is is designed to address the one that is has the greatest fiscal impact to to correct the mm -hmm. the, 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 the 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 130 million dollar cost of a of, of a hundred year flood and the time cost of after the flood, how long it takes to repair <laughs> things to be able to go and do that. Um, and that 130 million is in 2023 dollars. 2022 so close enough. going forward it that we can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, what is the permitting jungle look like for trying to do a project like this? How many different agencies are going to want to have a say? Well, let's talk about the agencies that are not agencies, but have a lot of influence. And that is the Nisqually tribe and the Puyallup tribe. They have tribal rights that vary depending upon what watershed they're in and whether it's a part of their use and custom hunting and fishing grounds. Um, there is the State Department of Fish and Wildlife. They have hydraulic project approvals or HPAs. Anytime you touch anything within the creek, you got to get a permit from them. Now, if we can do most of this work outside of the creek, there is a question whether that they would have authority or not. However, I would argue that we would lose that battle because they're going to say you are doing things that are impacting what's going on in the creek, nor would I want to alienate them because they are a really good resource for us. And we work with them. I've worked with them successfully in many different locales. Then there's the State Department of Ecology because there's gonna be water quality issues and there's, if there's any wetland issues, they're gonna to wanna to know about it. We have our own internal permitting processes that we'll have to go through uh, on the city codes. There may very well be um, federal requirements strictly because if National Marine Fisheries Services gets involved in this, and then we have to show how our project is, has either a mitigated effect and that we were able to take care of it, or it's gonna have no effect on salmonids. We know that the salmon used to come up through here. Part of the goal here would be to make sure if we do things in the creek, we make it so it's more um, inviting, um, amenable to salmon if and or when they show up. Now, if the creek's dry, then they're not gonna show up. 
but if the flows return back to something more akin to what they have in the past, and then we see salmon up in here again, or we see small trout up in here again. So there's gonna be a lot of agencies and permits, and I'm probably forgetting a couple of them um, that will need to be processed through this. It's like I said before, this is not a simple project to undertake, but it's one that can be undertaken. It can be done successfully if we start and we're methodical and we bring in the right experts to help us with it. Um, Mr. Boki asked you a question that talked about the water flowing under Bridgeport and I-5. Um, is uh, the, the issue of a, of a city concern of the water flowing under Pacific Highway um, and the, uh, the railroad trestle that is in that vicinity that Bands over the creek, are they um, sort of outside the main significant impact of the of, of the flood, or are they also areas where you think the way they are, they'll be good during a flood? Well, based on the degree of modeling we've been able to do right now, um, it does not appear they need to be touched. However, as we go down the next body of work, we'll be taking a look at that very closely to make sure none of them would have any problems with the increased flow from 530 to 560 cubic feet per second. We are increasing the flow in the channel by a relatively, in the grand scheme of things, small amount, but we would need to make sure that there's no additional scour at any pilings or any of the culverts, make sure we're not exacerbating a known problem or an unknown problem we'll be looking at. Um, I mind a question because one of the impacts that currently exists with the floodplain as, as it exists uh, is uh, you address the, the matter of certain property owners or pe people who are, who are building or developing things, particularly if they finance it, uh, <clears throat> mandatorily needing flood insurance required to do that. If we were to build the levy as proposed, does the flood insurance on the on the, on 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 the, on the opposite side of the levy from the creek does that requirement go away, or do you have to get wait until the next FEMA map? Well, the beauty of it is, is if if we build a certified certified levy that meets the Army Corps of Engineers standards, and they certify this levy then we can submit a letter of map revision showing where the new floodplain is on the creek side of, of it. Everything on the other side is now removed from the floodplain. So if you're not in the floodplain, then more than likely your lender is not going to require you to have flood insurance. Now, some people may feel eh, they still want to for a little while. That's a personal decision for them. But there should be no reason why anybody who lives on the backside of a certified levy should be required to buy flood insurance. But that is a benefit that <clears throat> building a levy potentially has for folks who are on the right side of it. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay. You had a chart, uh, a, a slide that sort of showed a flowing timeline. That, uh, Which one? A next strategy, right. outreach engagement. This one. Or the technical. Uh, They're all this, the same. This, this one here. Uh, okay. So um, one of the things you want to know is you're looking for a council's position, to, 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 whether to move ahead. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that that means you'd be moving ahead along this stream. <laughs> uh, but... Um, where on here are there some milestones that we can evaluate that we could adjust or even stop? Mm -hmm. Redirect. Yes, that's a good question. Those are things we would need to develop um, as we develop in the scope's work. For example, geotechnical exploration. If we make a determination that from a geotechnical perspective that a levy is not a viable alternative, I will come to you and say, we need to come up with a different solution. We need to stop. You've got land acquisition and easement requirements. 
if there's a general consensus amongst property owners that they don't want us to do anything out here, we would come to the council for direction. Do we continue to push for it or do we stop? I'm gonna interject here a little bit. Uh, I'm getting a sense from council members that we don't wanna provide consensus on direction tonight that we'd rather chew on this over a study session, given the lateness of the hour and the significance of the topic. Yeah. So unless there's a, another question to illuminate that, I think we're gonna set this over to a study session. Yeah, if I could just finish my yep, current question in that. So, 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 so my, my, my question is, is that if, if in short order, we uh, give you some permission to move forward, you'll be starting along the pathway of that, that particular stream and the one before it mm -hmm. would do, but there are periodic points of where you would come back yep. to us and say, this is where we're going. And, these are the sunk costs that you all, we've already spent, but this is what it's looking like in terms of going forward. And we'd have multiple points where we could modify or even stop a, a project and go to a different alternative. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very good, and not to cut the conversation short, but it's obviously meaty, and I'm getting uh, a sense that we need to have a little bit more time that's intentional in an earlier hour of the day. So that would be my my thought there. Mr. Anderson. Positive, a positive comment, not a question. Thank you for your presentation, all your hard work on this. I just note that I, back in Washington, D.C. at the ADC conference, it's very clear that the Department of Defense is extremely interested in pursuing infrastructure projects outside the fence line, which create resiliency for the base and particularly with respect to climate resiliency. So there may be a, 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 a well-funded source that is amenable to participating in this. And I assume we're keeping Bill Adamson in the loop with SSMCP and all things flood control and that is, that is Clover correct. Creek. Great. Again, yeah, I echo the comments. Thank you for the hard work. It's a significant issue. Uh, hopefully it won't happen during our tenure, but we have to prepare for it. Mr. Caulfield, anything next? Uh, just real quick, Mayor and Council, um, the Senate released their capital budget earlier today, and it includes $309,000 for Fort Stillicum Park. If you recall, we had requested $250,000. It also includes $460,000 for the Lhasa project, even though we had requested $460,000. Um, both of those projects were sponsored by um, Senator Nobles. Great. Um, and then also on the uh, park and recreation side, uh, Wards Lake looks like is making the cut for $500,000 from WWRP and $350,000 for from the um, Youth Athletic Fund, which will go toward phase two of that project. And then also $350,000 from the Youth Athletic Fund in support of pickleball courts at Harry Todd Park. So um, that's what we learned today. The House is expected to release their capital budget um, later on in the week. So with that, that's my report. Great, Mr. Bokey. Just a couple more comments on that and that the Senate one, first of all, the the big goon on the whole thing is that, um, and I don't know if it's enough, but it's $650 million for Western State. So that was by far the largest item. The other item that may be of interest is, uh, and this is something, the Pierce County Housing Authority wants to sell all its single family homes that it owns. I have no idea where those are, but there was $14 million in the budget um, to allow them to allow Habitat for Humanity to purchase those homes. We've been a big supporter of Habitat for a long, long time. And so that might be, if that occurs, because they still have to go through the house and everything else. But if that occurs, that's something we may want to pursue with Habitat saying, okay, now you You've got this. The, the, the goal, as I understand it, is that they'll rehab these properties and then put them into their system. So, um, we and we've been extremely supportive of that. These are, will probably be outside Tillicum, I imagine, but I, I don't know where they all are. Maybe the 
they're that's randomly random. scattered. That's the reason for the divestment. It's a, a poor management practice that uh, the HUD has wanted them to uh, exit for quite some time. So, very good. Anything else, Mr. Coppell? That's it. Okay, we'll quickly turn to council comments. Mr. Boki, we'll start with you. Mr. Brandstetter. Uh, the uh, Community Services Advisory Committee did did meet. Uh, they're getting started on uh, on, on uh, developing the, uh, the annual plan that's required to go forward. That would be from July through through June uh, regarding the use of CDBG funds, and they they just had their first uh, sort of uh, meeting about going to do that. Uh, our funds are going to be similar to what we've had in the past, uh, uh, just a just a slight reduction, and the CDBG funds and in the in the in the home funds that we that we that we deal with uh, going forward. There is a um, uh, generally, Mr. Mr. Gum was suggesting to the committee that we we, we sort of do what we've done. Uh, in the past, with those in terms of sub allocations, with perhaps uh, there being uh, some some money to fill in some um, assistance programs that uh, were previously being funded by ARPA that that they, that they would want to continue. Uh, I think I think it's going to be a, a couple of months before we see that. Uh, and it, it comes to us in terms of what a proposal is for the annual action plan and the and the budget uh, for the year, but they've at least gotten gotten started on that process. You know, that's uh, all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Uh, I will be gone the next two Mondays on vacation, so pass anything you want to. Yeah, perfect. Council Member Bell. Yeah, we'll rezone. Thank you, Mayor. Day. I am good. Very good. Our newest council member, Treston Loricella. Yeah, uh, thank you. I have nothing to add. Very good. You didn't want to Step up to the invitation of public comment tonight to make that happen. It was okay. uh, interesting to hear. Very right. good. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Moss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just comment uh, the town hall meeting that I attended on Saturday went really well. A lot of positive comments came from the uh, audience, from the members, citizens, that uh, the work that we are doing on our roads they appreciate them and they appreciate all the efforts that we're putting forth to take care of the homeless and so forth. So it was a good meeting. Glad I was able to moderate that one. It was the first time it was interesting. And other than that, uh, on Thursday afternoon, the 62nd LF Wing will have this award ceremony and I will be representing the city of that. So thanks. Well, thank you very much. So I, I just wanna lead off with welcoming you again Mr. Lawrence, out to the dais here. It's it's good to have you on board. It's good to have a full seven member council, and so we look forward to your work with us. And thank you for your your initial indulgence today. So that's good. Uh, we had a conversation, Mr. Copfield and myself, with Shelley Helder with our 28th Legislative District Reps Levitt and Bernowski about the Police Pursuit Bill, and also about the legislature's response to the. Um, uh, Blake decision and what they're doing. I emphasized uh, the two ordinances that were coming before the council tonight and the fact that the community is uh, very concerned overall about public safety and how we were very hopeful that they would continue uh, their fine work in advancing that bill on police pursuit, even though we know in its pleasant present iteration, it likely will not have property crimes as one of those that folks can pursue uh, on uh, reasonable suspicion. 
So that is a, a detriment a bit, given what we have seen in terms of property crimes spiking up and vehicle crimes and theft spiking up, but it's at least a step in the right direction. And I understand they're supportive of the bill in its present configuration. Uh, we are, meaning the manager and the deputy mayor and myself, leaving for Washington, D.C. Uh, early tomorrow morning to meet with our federal delegation on issues involving uh, the loss of request for two and a half million dollars for completion of their phase three commons, as well as our other federal priorities. And I won't go through all of them tonight, but it looks like we've got a full complement of meetings on Wednesday. And uh, then we turn around and come back on Thursday. So it's going to be an interesting quick trip, leaving tomorrow, coming back on Thursday, and then uh, attending, at least I am, and I'm sure some other Rotarians are attending the uh, major fundraiser event this Friday, the 24th from six to nine at the Gavick Center. So if you need tickets, they're available. Again, it raises funds for a project that is in part supported by the city, that being the Dolly Parton Imagination Library for Early Literacy. So if you need information on it, uh, let me know. Otherwise, I hope to see you there. And unless there's anything further for the good of the order, we're adjourned.